All right. Hey, guys. So I'm just here with Dr. Avi. We're going to have a discussion about positive and negative rights. But in the meantime, I think we'll let a few of you accumulate here in the video. Uh, I'm just going to go over to the video settings and make sure that the stream is live and functioning properly. How are you doing, Avi? What's up, buddy, my dude? Okay, yeah, we have people <laughs> here. This is all good. Buddy, my dude, 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 my buddy. Buddy, my buddy, dude. Buddy, 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 dude of mine. <laughs> yeah, so um, I don't know, man. What have you been saying all day? What have you been up to? What are you doing? Okay, here we go. You're back. Okay, good. Yeah. Oh, uh, we are accumulating. I see it. Yeah, yeah. We'll just wait for a few of them to collect and then we'll delve in. Because there's nothing more annoying than you come to the debate and you miss. The and then there's, you miss like the most important, the, the foundation. You miss everything. You miss the prima yeah. facie of it all. Exactly. And that's good old, good old prima facie arguments, your favorite. Um, the yeah, irreducible, so... non-natural, tautological, prima facie, properly basic. <laughs> it's just, it's Principle. just magic. It's, it's just there. Just, so... No. <laughs> just... <laughs> No. Um, it just, no. I don't presuppose, I know. Yeah, well, I mean, my intuition tells me that it's the case. And unless you can falsify <laughs> my intuition, I expect you to trust it. It's like tummy, though. <laughs> tummy. <laughs> yeah. I had this, oh my god, do you remember this guy? Um, he was like uh, arguing that uh, supply does not equal demand. In the Discord. Oh yeah, that, oh, that was a crazy one. I actually got this. Was, I got the most heated I've ever gotten in in a Discord debate. I feel like with, I, with I missed a lot of that. I changed his oh. name at one point to "Supply Does Not Equal Demand." <clears throat> yeah. What, what happened? I mean, oh let's, man, let's everything something. boiled down to everything boiled down to his gut. He basically said, "But I'm just going to say it's different in this case because my gut tells me so." Um, what, and every answer, and demand is different. Well, he said that for his gut too. He basically said there was, he had no evidence. And then he said, well, I just think this way for, because of my gut tells me so. It's gonna be more likely not because of my gut. Then I said like, okay, well, what, what about a human? In the human context, would you do it? And then he said, no. And I'm like, what about the cow or the chicken context would you do? And then he said, yes. And I said, what's the difference? And then he gave me a bunch of big, at first he tried to name a few, then I just equalized the traits. And then he just dodged around a little bit. I shipped him back to focus. And then he basically just said, well, my gut tells me so. And <laughs> then we got into a debate on which I hope <laughs> I hope that was also put into the format of name the trait. Like gut though. The trait is my gut. <laughs> the trait is your gut. Yeah. I it's just like, okay, so you know, if, if your gut tells you to to rape a young child, is that are you gonna trust your gut? So then I so I pointed this out. I said, like, well, what if your gut says in the future to destroy an entire universe? Um, and then he said, well, I understand in principle, it's got, that doesn't, there's nothing in my moral system that says not to do that, but don't you think it's dangerous to not trust your gut? No, <laughs> like, no. it's, like, it's like, that's not, not a fucking argument. It's like, got, like that, that, that was the most heated debate I've ever gotten. He was so, so Weasley, next level Weasley. Well, yeah, and I will give you credit because you're very good at catching the uh, the weaseliness. So, like, I mean, for those of you who don't know Dr. Avi, um, he first showed up how long ago now? Oh, man. Um, what was it? April? April? April, okay. May, so, June. So, for, forgive my lack of math. <laughs> April, May, June, July. Okay, it's so like four months yeah, ago. Yeah, like four it's months, up, right? Approaching half a year. First appeared in the discord as a carnist actually so mm -hmm. um we had some extensive debates that really annoyed me because uh <laughs> you know, <laughs> obvious is a smart guy like i know i know that everyone thinks that i think i'm smarter than everyone because i'm always calling people stupid and i do think that i'm smarter than most people so i'm not gonna be dishonest about it but i am honest when i meet someone mm -hmm. who's in the same ballpark or higher and yeah so debating with someone who is good at debating like actually good is super annoying. Uh, so we had um, <laughs> we we had these like, extensive autistic battles. Yeah. Avi yep. is known for for his extreme levels of autism. So like, I mean, I I could give you many examples. Like, 
he, he to argue against the anti-natalists saying that nuking all life would be a good idea um because just nuke everything on the planet it'll kill off life and that'll equalize well-being he went and did some autistic calculation about the, the in fact Avi, why don't you describe yep, the calculation yep. so so basically if you look at the uranium the amount of uranium in the crust of the earth and if you factor in the 0.7% of that uranium that's going to be furred off from nuclear weapons, if you actually harvest all of that, then what the problem is, you'll be, have enough of a nuclear bomb. If you converted all of that uranium and you centrifuge and everything, you put all the mankind to contribute to that cause, and you put them all into Tsar bombas, and you were to wipe, try to wipe out all life, you would be able to get all the surface area of the land the problem is you wouldn't actually get all the deep sea life. I, I want to so also say, just no, notice how he autistically steel man them by using the largest bomb possible also. <laughs> you put it all into the largest bombs that it was ever made, or even larger ones. The, it, it scales with, it, it's, if you look at the amount of energy that would be released, and you look at the amount of the mass of the ocean. Wait, would it even what, matter if it was a ton of small bombs or a few big bombs? In terms of the energy, it, it shouldn't unless you, no. It, 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 in principle, it shouldn't. There may be some efficiency changes with the small bombs and large bombs that might make a difference. But okay, just sure, steel yeah, man, assuming yeah. there's no efficiency loss of the energy, assuming like a steel man them even further. Okay, okay so I don't know if the SAR bomb thing is actually even a steel man there. If a small yeah. bomb does the same thing, but whatever. Yeah, I, that's well, my calculation. My yeah, my calculation <laughs> basically is it, even if you steel man the 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 energy output. Um, what you'll find is if you were to take all of that and nuke the entire ocean, <laughs> nuke the, land and the entire ocean, <laughs> what will happen is the temperature of the ocean will increase by two degrees Celsius. That's it. Yep. That's Not all that will happen. You, you, you won't actually, and then the radiation, even if you try to get the deep sea up with the radiation, what's just going to happen is the density of the water will change by heating up, and then it would just rise up. So, anything, not going to exactly yeah. purge all life from the planet. It won't. What's and it would actually cause more suffering because life. What happens now is that you have a bunch of empty ecological niches, right? And now you have also life with neurons. So I'm going to steal men them further. We don't have to evolve neurons again. We don't have to do any biogenesis again. We don't have to evolve um, central nervous systems again. You have life with central nervous system that will evolve. That will necessitate by evolution they will if they have all these open niches to exploit they have they will be a selective pressure to exploit them and now they will exploit them with a radiation background so yeah. you will have started the process all over again well with more also, it, not an ethical thing to suggest so yeah. also you couldn't you also make the case that they're gonna have to like okay you know you read Pinker's book, uh, Better Angels of Our Natures, of Our Nature. He talks about the decline of violence. I've heard of this. I haven't read the book. Though. Oh, Avi, you'd love it. He, yeah, he gets into um, just all stats of insane levels of autism and just shows you just by all these measures, like you know, homicides and like like crimes, everything. Just violence is on a downward trend. Pre-state societies had a higher rate of death by violence than uh, the warring countries during the peak of World War II. So there's this argument that also if, mm -hmm. um, as you civilize, things get less violent, that restarting that process would you make you have to go through all those violent right. uh, stages of development of again, course. plus with a nuclear background. Yeah. And if anything, you can actually make a pro-natalist argument with that. You can say that, well, if I could bring beings into the world that will take an ecological niche over that current beings exist in and all they do is suffer, if I could take that over without killing them and I could just let them breed out and take over that niche without causing, assuming we're wanting away all of the, uh, the harms from destroying any ecosystems or environmental harms, let's just wand all of those things away, mm. right? Assuming we wand those away, you will actually decrease the net suffering if you can just take over that niche by putting more humans into the world rather than just animals that will be eaten alive. You're okay. I'm, I okay. I have questions about this now, mm -hmm. and this is yep. going to become a whole rabbit hole. But mm -hmm. are, are yes, it will. Yes, a, it will. Are, are you just saying a human has a better quality of life than an animal? So replacing I, more humans would be better than more animals to 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 an extent until unless it begins to a point where 
there were going to be externalities from that that would cause other negative effects. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. I could say more there, but we'll, we'll drop yeah. that. So anyway, he came into the discord as, as a, uh, carnist. These are the levels of autistic searching that we had to deal with. So like I had to argue with this guy about eating burgers to save cows. And then yep. about, um, we, about eating. Wait, 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 my first position though, my first position, it was me though. Remember that? Was you though? Was okay. You, I, don't, you remember, I don't remember you. I, I wasn't debating you. I was, I was debating, um, uh, Puffin. Some, Puffin. Oh, okay, yeah. No, not Puff, Puffin and, and Buddha. Yeah, who are both really good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, my argument was that was well, not exactly Destiny's argument because he has. I don't want to equivocate the accents, but it was. <laughs> oh, salty little shot was, there. Ooh. Yeah. But it was. Um, it was me though. Yeah, I only care about myself, and everything else I care about is an extension of myself. Mm. And okay, I just don't so care about I, animals, yeah. I don't remember them all sequentially. I remember there was, uh, okay, so there was apparently me, though, which I had actually forgotten. Uh, yep. I remember there was eating burgers to save cows. Then eventually I got this guy to go pescatarian. Pesco. Um, yes. But but he was just insisting on um, the there's no reason to value fish at that level of sentience. And then we had to debate retards, and he went on this crazy quest for all this fish data. Like, this guy will tell you all sorts of stuff about the uh, anti-fish sentient science crowd. <laughs> like, he's gone. I've read it all. I've read all of Rose. I've read all of Key. <laughs> those, are the two, those are the two guys. You'll see them published all oh. the time. They literally have made it their life mission to try and, and show that fish don't have sentience. Is, is there, like, is it just a, a purely scientific thing, or do you detect that it's got something to do with justifying eating them, or what's what's the... One of them is an avid, I've heard, is an avid fisherman. Hmm. Might be something there. Yeah, the danger of having, a like, some really smart guy who doesn't want to change have their yep. favorite hobby be fishing. It's like, he may go on a lifelong quest to just prove that fish aren't yeah. sentient. I don't know about um, the other guy. What, yeah, but they, they both have did, made it their life goal to just publish as much as they can, arguing that fish are not sentient. And I've read just about everything they published. Like, cover to cover. I wonder if there's any uh, videos or even, even text of them debating. Um, anyway, so yeah, ba basically, yeah, we had that debate. Finally, Avi went vegan because he couldn't handle there being a, a minor little area of grayness in his position. Yep. Um, but he's he's persuaded me off of points too, which a lot of people don't do. Um, it's probably a bad thing, but if you can make good arguments, then sometimes you might be making good arguments for bad things without realizing, but other people who are good will show you your errors. So this guy's got me on a few things too. Um, yeah, so anyway... Um, Basically, I think now we've got enough people here, so let's delve into the actual topic. Um, oh, man. So, and, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what else to say about Avi. He's a doctor, a bodybuilder. He's got a channel. He doesn't post to it currently. I convinced him to build a channel. Uh, technically, is that an argument I won? I don't know. But um, go and subscribe to it. It's down below. If he does ever make content, you'll be happy you subscribe. So, um, yeah, basically today we're going to talk about positive and negative rights. Um, I guess I'll define those things quickly. So a negative right is a freedom. Uh, it's a freedom from. So it's a right not to be interfered with. So, for example, the right not to be murdered, the right not to be stabbed or raped, freedom from. Uh, and then positive rights are basically entitlements to. So that's an entitlement to a provision of some kind of good or service by someone else. So a positive right to health care or to being, you know, saved if you're dying and someone else is able to save you. Um, this does divide a bit politically. There's people on both sides who hold both positions, but positive rights, uh, both sides obviously believe in negative rights. The only people who don't believe in negative rights are crazy subject guards from the Krill server who are going to tell you that, you know, that we shouldn't have anti-murder laws. Morality is just fuck morality. Um, virtually everyone on every side of the political aisle, it's totally nonpartisan, is in support of negative rights, freedom from uh, exploitation or, or whatever may be imposed on you. Uh, then positive rights, that's more traditionally divided. And, you know, the positive rights are associated with the left and the negative rights are associated with the right. So, like, when the left wants um, things provided for society, when you're talking about, uh, you know, social health care, uh, socialized education, 
these kind of things, if they're talked about in the language of rights, those are positive rights that are being talked about. Uh, the, the right is more in the camp of, of believing in liberty, kind of uh, freedom from, uh, and more like li libertarians, especially, like very, very much like you don't have a right to compel anyone else to do something for you. I mean, they'll talking about free healthcare, give you arguments like, do you have the right to, you know, put a gun to someone and force them to perform a medical operation? So, you know, that the, the right more so talking about negative rights. OK, so that's what positive and negative rights are. Positive rights, those are, or sorry, negative rights, that's freedom from. Uh, that's a right not to be interfered with. And then positive rights, that's a obligation someone else has towards you to provide some kind of good or service to do a thing for you beyond just respecting your negative rights. Um, I think, I'll, do you have anything to add there? No, I think you summed it up pretty, pretty <clears throat> solidly. Um, okay, yeah. cool, nice. Uh, and then I think just because we're talking to a vegan audience, it's worth talking about the connection between this topic and veganism. Uh, and the connection is pretty small. I mean, veganism follows from negative rights, which everyone's on board with. You can just use a logical consistency test like name the trait and demonstrate that for, for anyone who's got basic negative rights on the table and they don't have them on the table for some absurd reason, like, you know, as personal preference or something like this, uh, that's going to lead to veganism for them. So the argument for veganism, you would make from negative rights. You wouldn't have to talk about positive rights. Um, whether you accept positive rights or not, that would not have any uh, impact on veganism one way or the other. Negative rights would do it. So that's the relation to veganism. Because I don't like when people watch these and they get hung up thinking, wh which side I choose is going to affect my position on veganism. It's like, well, well, no, because that's not really the case. It's like the positive rights wouldn't have an impact on veganism. The negative rights lead to veganism. And we're already on board with that. Uh, anything else there on the relation of positive and negative rights to veganism? Uh, no, uh, just, uh, just to add that, um, well, we, we're going to get into this later, but, um, whatever positive rights you extend to humans based on whatever metric you extend them on, you would have to be in the name of trade situation to not apply them to animals too. And we can get into yes. yeah. of, of course. Yeah. So for people who do accept positive <laughs> rights, obviously you apply a logical consistency test to those positive rights when you're assigning them to humans and questioning, assigning them to animals. And if there's not a basis for uh, dividing up those two categories, a logically consistent basis, then the positive right will extend to animals. But there we're talking about uh, you might have additional things on top of veganism that follow if you're on board with positive rights. In fact, they will follow to the degree that you're on board with positive rights and cannot name the traits in the cases that you are on board. Um, but it's that as, yeah, no, there's nothing about positive rights that would impact um, veganism in the direction of you have less reason to become vegan. Yep. Good. Okay, Good. cool. Perfect. Okay. And then finally, I'll just give you the format. So Avi and I actually hold the same position here, which is basically uh, a, a sort of like mild positive rights position. Uh, positive rights light. Positive rights light. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it has been coined. Uh, now, I'm going to, I think, <laughs> play devil's advocate here. So, you know, remember, I am not saying things that I believe in this debate. Uh, and I think that the sensible thing to do is sort of approach it from, you know, both sides. So I'll talk about the negative rights, and then I'll talk about the positive rights. And I think we'll uh, start with the negative. And we're just gonna make our way through it and see if Avi can talk me onto his position. And if one of Let's you guys- Let's do it, buddy, my dude. I'm ready. <laughs> if one of you guys thinks you can make a better case than me for you know, one of the right systems, then this guy is in the Discord. Uh, it's linked below. You can come and see if you can catch him sometime in there. All right. Good to go? Good to go. Let's do it. Okay. So I guess we'll start with just negative rights. So, you know, I believe that I have a, a we should all be free to do whatever we want. We should all be able to, you know, punch around or stab or wh whatever, so long as our doing what we want is not interfering with someone else's ability to do what they want. Uh, I hold also just, you know, like a basic belief in the in the non-aggression principle. I'm I'm all for, you know, you can't aggress against someone else. You run up on a negative rights barrier there, but uh, the you don't actually have positive compulsions to other people. I think that it would be wrong to say that you are forced to serve others. Yeah. So you're taking the position of just negative rights and no positive rights at all. 
Yeah, no, fuck positive rights. I mean, I don't think I owe things to other people. I think I have a right <clears throat> to not be exploited by other people and I should be able to just do my thing. All right. So the classic example that's given to this is the child drowning in a lake, for example. So let's say hypothetically, you walk by and there's a child that's drowning in a lake. And the only thing you lose from saving the child is a little bit of effort, extending your arm, and maybe you'll get your shoes a little bit wet. And then the question becomes, do you believe that, not, that it, is, it would be good for you to save that child, but it's not an obligation for you? So you, you're just, if you just walked along right by, you, you would be like, okay, it would be good if you did it, but hey, I mean, it's not an obligation. Or if you in that moment see a child drowning and the only thing you have to do is extend your hand, get your shoes a little bit wet and save that child. Is it not just a good thing to do, but are you, do you have a moral obligation to do that? I think that you have a, uh, it's, it's a virtue and it's a good thing to do, but I don't think that you're actually obliged to. I think that if you talk about being obliged to, I mean, there's, there's kids all over the world. I'm obliged to all of them. I don't, I don't know. Like I'm probably just going to virtually become a slave to others at that point, because there's always people I could help in the world. I think that I just have yeah. a freedom to not help that child, but it's good if I can yep. to the extent that I want to. All right. Let's say there were a million children. So there's a million children now that are drowning and you have a superpower. You could save all of them. All you have to do is take a drop of water, put it on your shoes, tap your shoes together. They all get saved. Is it a moral obligation now for you to put a drop of water on your shoes and tap them together? Oh, and then all the kids, go, all the kids go home. Well, that's unrealistic. That's unrealistic crazy. though. Unrealistic. Um, yeah, so you need to grapple with the logical extensions of your moral system, regardless of the realistic nature of the hypothetical or not. So tomorrow, if this hypothetical were real, so imagine, so in this hypothetical, the hypothetical is real. So tomorrow, if you found out this actually was real, like this is like, wow, I didn't think this could ever happen, but it's real now. Does your position change? If there's a million kids dying, I have to I have to save a million kids. And all you need to do to save the million kids is to take a drop of water, put it on your shoes, and tap them together. What what does the what does my answer to the hypothetical matter? Why why can't I just um why can't I just not really deal with that and instead just, you know, deal with what my situation says in the other cases that I'm actually encountering in my day to day life? You mean why can't why can you uh, not choose to just ignore hypotheticals? Well, I mean, some hypotheticals <laughs> are, 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 are just, it's not yeah, just so, that they happen to be inconvenient for me. They're just I just think they're useless. That's never yeah. it's so hypothetical that it will never happen. Yeah. So a number of things. Um, number one, to say that it would never happen requires a matryoshka brain. That's number one. Number two is even if it never would happen, it, the hypotheticals are useful because they test the logical extensions of your moral system. And they see if there's an internal contradiction there. And even if there's an internal contradiction in a completely unrealistic scenario, there's a principle of explosion. And even if you have a contradiction, even in some offshoot area where it's unrealistic, the entire system becomes useless. And so if you can't answer this hypothetical, if you're ignoring the hypothetical because you understand it would lead your moral system to an internal contradiction, then your whole system goes, it just explodes. Your system's useless. Okay, well, I don't know if a million kids is enough because the, I mean, there's probably already that out there and I don't want to spend all my time just helping everyone. Infinite, to... infinite drown a cost. So it's an infinite drown a cost. It's an infinite drown a cost. So, so I have a choice of either saying that, that it's a virtue or obligation to stop the infinite drown a cost if mm -hmm. the only effort it takes to do so is, is what, to wipe water off my shoe or something? Yep. yep. Well, so, you, so would you say, like, someone said, I'm not going to get the water on my shoe. I'm going to let an infinite child drown a cost happen. Would you say, you know what, that would have been a pretty good thing. That's a pretty good thing if you did it. But... You're, you're cool. You're cool. Let's not come on. 
It wasn't yeah, a moral obligation I, or anything. It's, it's just that that's the border of negative rights right there. So the second that I say that you have an obligation to that, the negative rights part of this debate will be, I mean, basically done because that's your, I'd have to be on board with some level of positive rights there. I think so. Yeah. Isn't, isn't there any isn't there any danger to getting on board with the positive rights? I mean, yep. What what if I don't I don't want my whole moral system to slippery slope into me living some slave level quality of life to help other people? I mean, that seems worse to me than yeah. uh, than the situation of uh, the the drown cost. I mean, maybe not at the infinite level, but like it seems pretty bad to, for me to become a slave and everyone else to become a slave. Yeah. So the issue is like, once you accept positive rights, then what is your obligation? How much is your obligation? And there's the problem is even in the real world, there's people suffering all around the world. They're starving children in Africa and whatnot. And your money will usually almost always be better suited in terms of a well-being, the suffering standard in their hands than your hands. So yeah. that's, that's the issue. Right. Yeah. So you'd be talking about setting some kind of bounds on the positive rights somehow. OK, well, I think that this is the point where I'll pretty much have to get off board with negative rights. Um, I mean, if someone else thinks that they have a better defense against negative rights at that uh, against uh, dropping negative rights, you can you can try to make it. But it seems to me that if that's the situation I'm going to end up in where I have to say it's not a moral obligation to save infinite kids from drowning if it takes no effort. Um, I think that that's a position I'm not really comfortable with. So let's say I want to take some level of positive rights position now. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on board with positive rights, but I'm not on board with this thought of, I don't, I don't want to cascade into slavery. How could there possibly be a principled way to stop that? Isn't any point just going to be arbitrary if I say, you know, I want to I want to stop my positive rights um, right here as opposed to right here. Right. What kind of consistent principle could I possibly use to do that? Yeah. So the first thing I want to mention is the, the fact that something is going to be an arbitrary point or may may or may not be an arbitrary point. If you're a subjectivist, that shouldn't really matter that much to you. What should matter is if you apply that arbitrary point consistently, does it get you to a conclusion that you think is insane or not? Right. So I'm not concerned with the arbitrarity of whatever point you're drawing. What I would be concerned is I would be concerned with where that point would lead. The logical, the logical extensions of where that point that you draw would lead to. OK, so the, this is the first defense of like the middle ground and we'll run through it. It's a deep rabbit hole, people. So, okay, so, and for anyone who's not clear on the framing, so we've attacked the middle ground position from down below, and I felt uh, maxed out on my ability to defend that. I don't, I don't see how I can, I can get around the infinite drowning cost. So now we're kind of attacking it from above. I mean, how does, how does some positive rights not cascade into all positive rights? What principled basis could there be for stopping that slippery slope? Yeah, so the first attempt would be to say, okay, I'm going to give some money to help people, but I'm not going to give enough. There's going to be some threshold in which I'm going to stop giving once I feel like it's inconveniencing me too much or causing me too much suffering. And then once that stops, I'm, once that gets to that line, I'm going to stop helping. I'm going to stop giving. So I'm willing to give and I'm willing to help people, but I'm not going to reduce everything to I can't even buy a thing of ice cream. I can't even buy... Uh, any, any flowers for my girlfriend. I can't do anything. Literally nothing. Well, yeah, because... I mean, that sounds pretty much like my, like my position. I mean, I'll take I'll take that position right now. Like, I think that there should be a kind of threshold. I think that you have to set some point, and I'm gonna say, you know, I'll help if if it's really bad. Like, if if we're gonna get, um, you know, some massive death or, or Holocaust or something, but I don't, I don't want to have to help with every single person. So I'm, I'm going to put a threshold there. Yeah. Now sounds reasonable to a lot of people, but the problem with this is that whatever threshold you set, I don't care if it's arbitrary or not, that's fine. I'm cool with it being arbitrary, but whatever threshold of convenience that you set 
that if you were to go past this point, you're going to stop helping. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to put you in a hypothetical where you can go beyond that convenience just a little bit and save a million lives or a billion lives or an infinite number of lives in some weird off hypothetical that is unrealistic, but you still have to deal with it. Okay. So I'm, you know, I'm not sure I understand. So mm -hmm. I, if I say the threshold for where I will help other people is, you know, it's, it's high enough that I'm down to give some money to charity, but it's not so high that I'm going to, you know, sacrifice my quality of life or something. Like I'm going to live a good life on my end, mm -hmm. just a regular average life. And I'm going to give, you know, some fraction of my money to charity. And I set my threshold at, you know, uh, that's how far I'm going to go to help uh, others. So what, what could be wrong with that? I mean, that seems pretty fair to me. So let's say there were trillions and trillions of people that were being tortured and you can stop the whole thing from happening, but you have to live a really bad life. You have to basically live as a servant that your whole life, but trillions of humans, multiple planets of humans that are being tortured would no longer be tortured. They would live great lives. Now. Do you do it or do you not do it? That's well, a hard question. Um, okay, so it's a choice of if I set a threshold on how much mm -hmm. I'm willing to help mm -hmm. others. Yep. You're just trying to scale up the amount of people who are suffering. Yep. And who I could do something to help. Yep. And if you don't budge on that threshold, then basically what's going to end up happening is you're going to look at planets and planets or galaxies of humans being tortured, and you're going to say, no, I'm not. I'm no, no longer morally obligated to save any additional one of them because here is my threshold and I'm not going to move one inch past it. I'm, I have no obligation to move one inch past it. Okay. Well, you know, fine. Fuck the threshold. Let's take it to a more mathematical level. So maybe I want to do something like instead of a threshold, let's do um, the total um, change in their suffering produced by me helping with with whatever given thing it is versus the to minus the total change in my suffering. And let's say, you know, if that um, number is in the right mm -hmm. area. So if we let's like we could put a threshold on it for when it switches from a virtue to an obligation. Let's say well, can we draw it out for the audience. Can we draw it. We, we can draw it. We and, and we'll basically. Yeah, here. In fact, I can bring up paint program. Actually, I can't because I have a Mac, so I can bring up some shitty alternative to that, which is preview. <laughs> um, oh, wait, did I uh, did I start sharing the screen, though? Okay, I need to share the screen. Uh, okay, let's see if this works. All right, are you seeing No, it's the Holocaust? infinite Holocaust. Okay, all right. <laughs> and now you're seeing a white screen? Now I'm seeing a white screen. Now okay, we're good. All right. So let's uh, let's see if we can edit this shit. Um, all right, I'll get a pencil. Okay, nice. Um, oh no, that's drawing loops or some shit. You know, this is the the problem of Max. They're not the best. Um, oh, is there no way to type? Okay, there's letters here. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I'm gonna do. Um, let's get some text here. And let's let's make this. Uh, all right, we'll do, uh, so X, which is the, um, let's call that the decrease in their suffering. Mm -hmm. Then let's go minus Y, which is the um, increase in my suffering. Yep. Okay. Uh, I hate how this program's formatted. I want to make it long enough for everyone to see. Okay, so decrease in their suffering minus uh, the increase in mine. Um, okay, and then let's just say that, um, and this is why I need a new computer, guys. Stop making fun of me. Let's say that we, uh, here we go. <clears throat> okay, and let's say, we'll set a threshold on this. So if the number is, let's do um, between zero and 100, these numbers are arbitrary. 
Um, we're just assuming there's a way to quantify units of suffering. If it's a between zero and a hundred, we'll say that that is a morally virtuous action. Uh, and we'll say if it's over a hundred, that it's actually uh, morally necessary, uh, obligatory. Okay, so how's that then? We'll do we'll do the decrease in their suffering minus uh, the increase in my suffering. So we'll get we'll get like basically a kind of differential there, a number, and then based on how strong that number is, it may or may not be a virtue or an obligation. So, so you know, take that with your stupid, you know, threshold leads to an infinite Holocaust yeah. bullshit. And obviously anything below zero would just be a moral vice um, because we that would that just, yeah. yeah. I, say, I say we don't talk about mm -hmm. the belows just to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, can, we can avoid that, future. yeah. Yep, okay, <clears throat> so. So you're setting an di absolute difference between the decrease in their suffering and the increase in your suffering from helping them. And mm -hmm. if it comes below a certain degree, above zero to a certain threshold, whatever that value is, you will say that it is, a, is morally virtuous. And if it is above that threshold, you will say it's more ob ob obligatory. Now- Yeah, because what this does yeah. is it allows me to say, you know, if you scale up their suffering high enough, then you will, uh, get oh did i set this in the right order though i might have set this in the wrong order um, no you I set it in the right no you're, you're good you're yeah. good yeah because okay. look so okay so if x so if you scale up x so if you scale up their suffering then your number is always going to be over 100 if you keep yes. scaling Correct. it up so Correct. you avoid you avoid this uh the infinite holocaust now do you avoid the vacuum do you avoid living as a slave if you increase y if you scale up y which is your suffering then you can land in the zone that's between zero and 100 Mm -hmm. While okay, at the same so time, can, if you increase X, you avoid the infinite Holocaust, and if and you still right. have yeah. perfect. So, okay. so this will get me around basically both problems. I mean, there's mm -hmm. this original problem we had with the drowning kid when we were talking about just negative rights, and it felt uh, kind of ridiculous to say it's okay to drown infinite kids. So you have to have some level of obligation. Um, mm -hmm. at some point, surely you have to have some level of positive obligation unless you want to bite the bullet on that, which I mean, I don't, uh, but then there's the cascade into slavery, but you can actually change. You can get out of that by saying, you know, if my suffering is high enough here, then we could, uh, result again, we'd have to set these numbers properly and calibrate everything, but you could have it where there is a zone that you can land in where something is virtuous, but not obligatory. So that would stop the cascade into pure shittiness so yep. you know i think that that's a pretty reasonable place for me to go at least in uh in principle all right so i so think now the, I might now now we get into the problem zone all right all right okay i'm just gonna turn the share off oh more more infinite holocaust okay <clears throat> so the problem is what happens when I take Y and put it right to zero. So Y was the uh, increase in uh, Isaac's suffering from doing this act. And so basically if I put it at zero, what happens is you end up in a situation where you literally could do nothing. You lose nothing. You there is no loss to you at all. You don't even have to take into account even an opportunity cost. Because all these actions that we do, have some opportunity cost to it, even snapping my fingers, even do nothing at all. No, not a plunk second of time is lost from you. And you can help these individuals, you can, you can help them and it would result in a value of 99. So basically I have an action that I, a non-action I can take. It requires no effort on my part and it can help people it, it'll it'll help some people well i mean I, I don't know unless it's over the obligation point i don't see why that should be that important so let's say it wasn't uh so we're in the real world we're talking about starving kids we're talking about people dying from malaria let's say it wasn't that far let's say it was just a kid getting diabetes or let's say it was just a kid getting an infection or let's say we can we can scale it back even more. We can say, let's say it was just a kid that was being bullied and getting punched in the face. And you, you know, the, kid, the bully is punching, you see this 
kid crying. He's being punched in the face by a bully. And in this hypothetical, you are looking and you're seeing this happen. And you could take a non-action. You could do less than snapping your fingers. You don't even have to do that. And you would stop this whole event from happening and both the kids would just go on with their merry day. Now, would you say in that situation that it would be a moral virtue, but not an obligation if you literally lose nothing? Nothing, not one plonk second of time. You don't lose anything and you prevent this kid from getting punched in the face multiple times by this bully. You know what? I'm gonna take it back a step because I don't even know if I want to if I want to be here. It seems to me like, why why can't I just say something like, you know, look, the most effective way f- I, I do accept the positive rights and I do accept that I have these very strong obligations to others. But let's say that I just hold, you know, the the view that the most effective way for me to do that is actually for me to build myself up as a person and <laughs> you know spend my money on things. <laughs> yeah, spend my money on things. <laughs> other than uh, you know, just the bare necessities. Like, look at it like this, Avi. If I right now were to start giving all of, all of the extra money I make, every possible thing I have beyond what's the bare necessities to uh, you know, charity or something, that would really limit my quality of life right there. Like, even if I give it to, let's say the, the most effective charity, I give it to like against malaria, which, you know, the effective altruists really like them. They're sort of known as one of the most effective charities, it's the most uh, you can do towards saving human lives per dollar. Uh, you know, it's buying mosquito nets for kids in Africa. So, you know, I, I will, let's say that I do hold that goal and I actually want to do those things. But look, if I were to right now start giving all my money to that, let's picture two worlds. One where mm-hmm. right now I start saving all my money or I start doing that with all my money. And then uh, a second world. And then you look at, we're graphing the amount of money uh, given to against malaria over mm-hmm. time. Okay. Yep. Uh, money on the X, uh, time on the, or sorry, money on the Y, time on the X. Now, I mean, let's picture adding a world two line to that graph. So in world two, I give less money now. I don't give any money now. So there's a big flat point. But then I build myself up. I reinvest that money in myself so that later I can make more money. And then Mm -hmm. the line will overtake the other and I could actually give more to charity that way. So I'm not in principle disagreeing with the positive rights. I'm just saying, you know, pragmatically, the best way to bring them about is not to dedicate all of your life to charity immediately. It's to build yourself to a good level and then do what you can from there. All right. The pragmatic arguments. I love it. All right. Okay. So... A couple of things to say about the pragmatic argument. Um, number one, you don't know that. Um, so, for example, if you were to take money and invest in yourself, it's possible, sure, I mean, it's possible that the pragmatics would go in your favor and you get even more money to donate. That's true. If you invest in yourself, you could also just lose your investment and you get less money to, to give to the Africans also. Um, so there's a co- there well, are costs. Uh, let's why don't why don't we not assume that's the case? Because I think that it's safe to assume that if I work uh, nice and hard and I follow a pretty standard path, you know, get an education, do the standard stuff, it's pretty reasonable to say that if I do that, I can make more money than I'm currently making. I think I could get like you know a, a, a good enough job if I did that, and it would be pretty stable. I'm not taking any big risks. So let's. Let's take out the philosophy yeah. wand and let's just wand away yeah. that potential and say I take a safe route. Yeah. So what I'm going to do, so two things I'm going to do. Number one, I'm going to wand, wand right back to you and I'm going to say, <laughs> let's just say, that. oh, here it is. Now, let's just say that that didn't happen. Let's just say that the pragmatics didn't work out in your favor. Let's just say, okay, maybe it's an assumption, but let's just say it didn't. Do you now believe if the pragmatics didn't work out in your favor, do you now believe that in principle it would be right to live like a slave? That it would be right to live your entire life like a slave? Just, if you've had a crystal globe right now and you found out that the best way to save, the, most, the best you can do with your life is to live like a slave right now to save as many Africans as possible. Okay? Yeah, there's probably some people who are kind of stupid and don't have much potential and that's actually probably true for them. Yeah, but do you think they have a moral obligation to live as a slave now? Um, 
I mean, I don't want to say that people should have to live as slaves. Something seems a bit crappy about that. But I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just really convinced that that's pragmatically not the case. Okay. And, but if it was the case, again, I'm, so yes, you're convinced that it's pragmatically not the case. But regardless, you, the first thing I would say is you still have to deal with the logical extensions if it, of your moral system if it was the case. So that's number one. So if it was the case, you still can't contradict your moral system. And number two, the other thing I want to say about this is no one lives honestly like this. When you buy ice cream, when you go and buy, and buy ice cream, you're not thinking, you know, the reason I'm buying ice cream right now, it's because, I'll tell you why. It's because I am gaining well-being. I'm gaining pleasure. And that's going to motivate me to do better at my job and to Obviously. get all this more money. And then I'm going to save more African kids. That's what that's I'm exactly, I, that's That's exactly what I think. I mean, when I... <laughs> Yeah, don't laugh at me. This is my this is my moral view. So when I uh, when I go and buy something nice for myself, like if I go and buy an ice cream cone, I mean that that is basically what I'm thinking. I'm like, look, if I don't keep my well being at a pretty good level, it's even the case with you know if I want to buy like a fancy you know five thousand dollar designer suit or something, it's like that suit will help me get into certain niches in life and yeah. and present in a certain way that's necessary to get in certain situations and things that can seem, you know, pretty peripheral to, to, mm -hmm. you, you know, it can seem not, not that central to, uh, your survival, uh, you're not even really connected to your survival can actually be extremely useful for advancing yourself because your whole quality of life and way of presenting is going to affect your way of like interfacing with certain people, climbing business structures, networking. So that's, that's important stuff. Yep. So I do think of those things. It might not always be in my mind, but it, it is the underlying thing going on in my head. Whenever I'm buying something, um, buying something uh, that's a luxury. Yeah. So whenever you buy anything that's a luxury, whenever you wash your clothes one extra time, whenever you shower one extra time and use up that little bit of sex or soap, you're thinking about those African lives that you're going to save. <laughs> well, do I, do I have to be directly thinking about it? Or is it, in fact, not even good if I directly think about it? Because then that would take the well-being out of the well-being that I need to enjoy to save the most African children. Well, no, you would get more well-being because you know you'd be saving more African children. Okay, so what's wrong with that? So I'm, 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 what's wrong is it's completely dishonest. It's the, it's the most cringiest thing anyone could possibly say. No one operates like this. How do you know? It's, it's like going to, when, you, when you go, I don't believe that when someone buys a suit and goes to a job interview and then says, oh, nice suit, nice tie. I like what you did. Yeah, it's a good apple. It's like, yeah, man, I did it for the Africans. That's what I did. It. I'm yeah, going to get my well-being up. And do but, but wait, 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 wait. But at the same time, though, you don't think it's possible to have an underlying motivation uh, that's that's kind of the driving reason you think it's it's right to do something, but then uh, sur surface level motivations that you are engaged in in the moment and that maybe you might even think that is most beneficial to the underlying uh, motivation to allow the surface motivations to become uh, central in your mind? It's possible, but this is not the underlying motivation. Isaac, listen, listen. When you have sex with a woman, okay, and instead of working an extra hour so you can give some money to the Africans, you have sex with a woman instead. After you finish up, do you go and say, I can't wait for that extra African to be saved? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I, think, I think this is the point where I'm going to have to abandon the pragmatic argument because I don't feel that I can honestly say when I'm uh, buying a good or enjoying my quality of life that the, the motivation there is saving the African children. Uh, and I also think that it's, it's, you can probably make a pragmatic counter argument mm -hmm. if you were to delve into it with full autistic powers and look at the data on it, like, I mean, I don't know if I could meet the burden of proof on a lot of those things being essential to developing a certain quality of life. I mean, it sounds like 
like pretty pretty speculative that that buying a certain soap dispenser would actually like help the African children. So yeah, on the grounds that I don't feel that's my honest motivation, and that I uh, also don't know if it's actually you know pragmatically like empirically true. And that would and be- also, even if it was pragmatically true, and it was your motivation in principle. Do you think if those things were there, that person, and we wanded away the scenario? Yeah. But then do you think in yeah. principle, these people should live like slaves? Yeah. If, if it were the case that you, you know, you want, you wand away the, the pragmatic, if, you know, effects of living your life in, uh, with a decent quality for yourself, you say the best way to save the African kids or to maximize well-being is actually to live as a slave. Do I think I should live as a slave? So yeah, that would be another reason to say no. So, okay, I'll move off the pragmatic point. So, Let's go back to what we were at before then. Fine. We'll go back to the equation. Okay. So I want to do uh, the change in their well-being minus the change in my well-being. And, you know, if we get a number over 100, it's an obligation to help. If we get a number between 0 and 100, then it's a virtue. Uh, and below 0, it's it's entering the immoral territory. So yeah. I think, we should probably um, go back to the, to the, to the drawing board to, to show the audience everything. Sure. And bring, yeah. we'll bring that and, and everything that follows. Okay, so I've got a drawing board on yep. the screen now. Okay. <clears throat> so the problem here is I'm going to give you a case where y is equal to zero. So that's the hypothetical I want to give you right now. Okay, so, so the increase in my suffering is zero. So I don't suffer at all. Yep, you don't suffer at all. And okay. x You've set, the, you've set the moral obligatory threshold to 100. So I will set X to 99. Yeah, and what kind of things would we have at the, like, around 100 level? Like, what kind of obligations would we be talking about? I mean, it would vary from individual to individual, but, like, it, it, it's 100. It's just a relative difference. So if you have a, if you set it to, uh, it depends on how much you're suffering to what they are. So, like, well, if you're, it's- yeah. Yeah, it's important for people to understand why we're setting it like this, because we want, again, to not be susceptible to this negative rights reductio of uh, supporting, you know, saying it's not a moral obligation to save infinite children for zero yeah. effort. But we also don't want to be susceptible to this like hard positive rights reductio where it's going to say that you should reduce your quality of life until it's basically hit equilibrium with people in like the worst area of Africa or something like this or wherever the equilibrium point is, just to maximize well-being for others. Like you should yeah. continue maximizing their well-being until it generates more overall mm-hmm. suffering in the universe uh, to to uh, to keep doing that for them instead of doing something for yourself. So you want to be suscept- not susceptible to either of those. So this is why it's good to do a X minus Y, basically, because... You know, if their if their suffering is high enough, if the change in their suffering is high enough, you have a really high X value, then that's going to actually, even if if I have to suffer, you know, I don't have to do that kind of, you know, be the 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 bullshit threshold of how much I'm willing to help. I, it's just if their suffering is big enough, I'm going to be obliged to help, uh, even if it means ruining my own quality of life. So I'm not susceptible to the infinite suffering. Um, uh, reductio that you had me on when I said that I want to set a threshold of how much energy I'm willing to put into helping others. But I'm also um, not susceptible to problems at the other end, like, uh, you know, helping people infinitely. Because if the uh, increase in my suffering is strong enough, uh, and the decrease in their suffering is uh, not at some excessive point where you've exaggerated it to like, you know, infinite beings or something, then it might uh hit the range of being a moral virtue instead of an obligation to help people. And I think, yeah. I think that that's just like a generally more fair position because I, I, yeah, I mean, it preserves the positive obligation, but to a reasonable degree and it doesn't, right. it doesn't. Yeah. So I think, I think that's good. And it doesn't lead to slavery. So I am yep. down with it. Let's do it. Okay. So let's say you, we set Y to zero, your increase in suffering is zero now. And we scale back the benefits. So instead of saving lives, instead of saving drowning children and whatnot, <clears throat> what we can talk about is things, even the even things scale down to like a kid would get diabetes or not, or an you infection. Know, Bobby, or I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to cut in. I feel like there's just one more thing I should make clear for people, which is that 
although these numbers are arbitrary, you could basically calibrate them so that, you, like Avi was saying earlier with setting arbitrary points, you'd be able to calibrate them so that the level of help that's necessary for you to spend your life helping the African children right now falls into the virtuous zone. But then you, you're not, the infinite would be uh, out of the virtuous zone and into the obligatory zone. So it's, it's, just, it's just important to clear up that the actual numbers don't refer to anything concrete. It's just a theoretical range that you could establish arbitrarily to allow certain actions and not others without these cra crazy reductios. So sorry, I felt that was essential. Yep. Yeah, so the problem with this is what happens when I set y equals to zero? So I set y equals to zero, so you literally can do a non-action. You can do nothing, you lose nothing, okay? So you don't, you, you don't expend any, any cost at all, whether it's time, whether it's effort, whether it's money, not a, dot, not a cent from your bank goes out. And you could take a non-action and save children, and you would say, oh yeah, I would, because that's, it's above 100. Um, but yeah. what happens? If I say, okay, well, instead of saving a bunch of kids, let's say it's just saving one kid from getting diabetes, or let's say it's just saving one kid from getting bullied at the school park and getting punched in the face. Let's say that's all, all, all that there is to it. Is it a moral obligation now, even though it's below the 100 threshold? Is it a moral obligation to take a non-action? To save someone from diabetes for literally no effort i mean it seems mm -hmm. like it would be kind of hard to say no i mean mm -hmm. maybe i just what if i just lower the threshold though why don't why don't i just bring the threshold down and then i could justify um you know saving those people but not not everyone to a point that i'm gonna have some crazy suffering so let's let's do this but i'm just gonna bring the threshold down to like 50 so it covers the diabetes yeah. case well then i'm gonna what about the kid getting punched by a bully case that's enough that what about like you see a a crying kid he's getting tormented he's getting ragged on the bully is punching him in the face he's he's the rest of his day is going to be ruined you're standing there looking at this kid this kid's crying the bully is, is wrecking him he's just murking this kid and you're and you would look and say it would be good if i were to yeah, fine. Do nothing and okay, save the kid. So, so fine. Okay, so I'll set the threshold below a beating. Okay, so it's like it's. I don't mind a kid being punched once. That's probably good for character. But like below a, a beating or something severe like that. What's wrong with that? How many punches would you say is not good for character? <laughs> okay, wait, wait. So a punch. Um, well, say it wasn't good for his character, Isaac. Hold on. Say the kid just gets punched in the face and then starts crying. Um, well, I mean, how do you know? It's and builds, and builds nothing. Let's just say it wasn't. Let's just say it, it, it all, all that happened, the only consequence of that is that the kid got murked in the face once, and then it ruined his day. And that's the you only consequence. I, I think that kid getting punched in the face once is worse, is better than me getting reduced to slavery. So I'm going to bite the bullet. Oh, okay. Well, then, but, well, bite, biting the bullet on, okay. So biting the bullet on you doing nothing. You doing nothing. Oh, well, that just sounds like your reason you're biting the bullet on doing nothing. You seem to be clearly uncomfortable with n doing a non-action to save this kid. You're biting the bullet of doing something you seem uncomfortable with. I don't know. Are you uncomfortable with? I mean, are you uncomfortable with looking at a child getting punched in the face by a bully? Um, and well, saying I mean, it's not a, po a positive obligation to do nothing to save it? I, I am, but maybe I care more about not being reduced to slavery. So I have to accept that shitty consequence to not be reduced to slavery. Yeah, but that just sounds like you're, it just sounds like you're uncomfortable with the logical extensions of the moral system, but you would be more uncomfortable. You, you see, you seem like there's no way out of it. I would be more uncomfortable with something else. It seems like you're, you're motivated in your reasoning there. It doesn't seem like you're, you're trying to structure well, what you're there, No, I mean, I'm not comfortable with the kid getting punched in the face, but then, I mean, if we abandon the threshold, that's going to, you're going to get into some weird territory there. I mean, if I, 
well, let's fine. Let, I'll okay. I'll set the threshold lower. Let's say I put the threshold at like below a kid getting punched. Like I and I don't care about some pinprick or something. You're not going to get me on that. I'm mm. stopping at at like something around anything that like actually hurts someone mentally or physically. So I'll threat, yeah. set the threshold there. What's wrong with that? Okay, so so the threshold's at what what where what number is it now? So if we started at a hundred. Um, yeah, it's, let's it's, put it to like, we tried 50. Let's just put it to like, like five. Okay. Yeah. So one to five is morally virtuous. And then five or over is more over five is morally obligatory. Yeah. So now yeah. the kid that gets punched in the face, the kid getting punched in the face is a moral, it's a moral obligation for you to, to save the kid, even if there's nothing. Uh, so in lieu of the fact that there is nothing that you're losing. So you get around that. You also yeah. got obviously, obviously you're going to get around the infinite Holocaust too, because your threshold's lower. So it's easier for things to go over the threshold. Sure. Um, the problem is in the real world with the starving Africans and whatnot, there is going to be an, a, a lot of money that you can give now that is gonna be above that threshold because they can use that money for way better goods than you can. And the suffering that they're enduring right now is way higher than that of a punch, right? So you would base, in order to abot, uh, to- This is just gonna to lead to slavery again. Yeah, it's, it's gonna lead, yeah. It's gonna lead, you would have to basically go down to living like a slave just a little bit better than the slave than you did before you would have to <laughs> you would have to like live as a slave but like the well-being the inverse well-being of not getting punched slave okay that seems like a bad idea all right so let's let's you know what fuck fuck that okay i think that it's just the absolute number thing that's making it bad let's say okay we're getting rid of the bad uh threshold so let's put it back to 100 i i was happy with that but it's this part up top can we instead of doing x minus y Let's do x over y. So let's make it like a ratio. So that should get me around this, right? So if I say that it's the decrease in their suffering uh, over uh, the increase in my suffering, we can get some different answers. So I think that'll save me from these reductios. Um, if I were to, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, we'll, oh, I'm going to have to change these numbers down here too, actually. Um, okay, so let's say that um, if it's, how should we do this? Um, decrease in their suffering, increase in my suffering. Okay, so uh, if it's below one, let's say that that's in the territory of, in fact, we don't even need to write that. We'll just write uh, between, you know, one and- Between fact, zero, can, zero and one. Between zero and one, it's bad. Wait, we, yeah, but we can, let's ignore, but we aren't doing the bad here. We're just gonna do the, in the positive range to, to keep it as simple as possible. So we, we could actually leave it leave it the same way. We can. Well, yeah, fine. We'll, we'll include the bad. We'll, we'll say um, uh, between zero and one is actually bad. And then one to a hundred is virtuous. Over a hundred is morally obligatory. So <clears throat> I think that this will get around the uncomfortable reductio situation. So <clears throat> let's, um, let's, let's try with the ratio and, and see what happens. In fact, okay. um, how about... Yeah, okay, so continue, sure. So the ratio gets you out of, okay, so decrease in their suffering divided by the increase in your suffering for helping them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we set, well, we can't set it to zero because we can't divide by zero, but we can say it's a limit as it approaches zero, right? So if it's a limit that approaches zero, you always get out of the, you don't have to reset your threshold anymore because your threshold is going to always be higher than a hundred because it's just, uh, it's going to approach infinity. It's a, it's a limit where Y approaches zero. So this is a case where you basically have to do nothing to help everyone to save everyone. Well, yeah, then, because if you just, yeah. Y gets down really, really small and it's some tiny decimal, it's just going to yield you a number uh, in the ratio. that's going to be well over a hundred. Yeah. So you you get out of the um, you get out and you're going to get out of the infinite holocaust too, because if you scale x up, mm -hmm. it's going to get over a hundred as well. Mm -hmm. 
And if you get out of slavery because if you scale Y up alongside X, so X is decently high, but Y is also very, would be very high, uh, but not higher than X, it can still fall between one and 100 where it's morally virtuous, but not morally obligatory. Okay, now <clears throat> let's make sure that's a confusing part. So let's make sure everyone's clear on what we're saying right now. Let's just let's just get optimum clarity on the the three uncomfortable things that have happened so far. So let's let's do a, uh, a, a autism level recap right now, so people understand what's going on here. Does that sound good to you? Let's do it. Bring right, the layers. So bring the layers on. Okay, so our first level of autism was I was trying to defend pure negative rights. So. That was getting us to that situation of, okay, there's an infinite drown of cost happening, and do you have an obligation to save those kids or not if it takes no effort on your part? So I think that there's no real way to argue against that. So I said, yes. So then we're at the second level of autism, which is basically, okay, well, now we're on boards with on board with positive rights, but then there's this risk of basically just a slippery slope into slavery. So that seems kind of uncomfortable. So then to, to overcome that, we went to the third level of autism, which was, okay, let's, let's set a threshold on how much energy I'm willing to invest in helping others. But then the problem with that is that when I hit my threshold on how much I'm willing to help, then you can scale up the amount of people suffering who I could help with little effort just infinitely high. And I have to say, no, I'm over my threshold. I won't invest this minor, tiny bit of energy or non-energy to help those people. So it's almost like just equivalently bad to the drowning kid original autism level. So um, then we tried saying, you know, okay, the, the, ra the um, threshold thing isn't going to work. Let's, let's make it uh, a more like a, a math kind of thing. Let's go uh, the decrease in my suffering minus the decrease in their suffering. So we ended up with some kind of uh, uncomfortable views there too, because if you set the increase in my suffering to zero and the decrease in their suffering, um, you you were to, uh, the, the increase in my suffering is nothing. And then mm -hmm. the uh, decrease, sorry, let me make sure I'm making sense here. Uh, there is zero suffering for me and it helps other people. Um, at that point, it would seem kind of kind of crazy to say oh well you know i've got no uh no obligation to help do you want to aid in the recapping so i'm not just talking the entire time yeah sure um okay yeah so basically we we started off obviously they're negative rights if you reject positive rights you look crazy because then you in order for that to if you would reject positive rights completely you have to reject an infinite drown of cost, baby. You have to you have to accept infinite numbers of children drowning just because you don't want to get your shoe wet. You could say, well, it would be a good thing to do, but I'm not obligated to do it. So that looks crazy. We should write these. So, yeah, let's write them. Write them down. Okay. Let's we'll do go, it. We'll, okay. Number we'll go. number one. Number one. We'll call it uh, <laughs> negative. We'll just say negative rights only. Okay. And the reductio, and then we'll write the reductio beside them. Um, yeah. Are you are you still seeing my screen right now? I, I see it. I see it. It's perfect. Okay. Okay. That's good. Negative rights only. So the reductio for that is basically In, infinite drown a cost. <laughs> the, the infinite drown a cost. Okay. So infinite drown a cost. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we got negative rights only. That's going to lead to the infinite drown a cost, which is not a word apparently. <laughs> Fucking Microsoft Word is not creative enough. So then. What we we go okay. The infinite drown of cost is bad. So what do we want to bring up? Then now? we, we then we say, try okay, with let's, let's positive rights. Yep. So positive positive, positive rights. rights and and we'll we'll just I mean we'll assume negative rights is already in place for the rest of these. I won't even bother writing that. So let's say say pause. Well, whatever. Yeah, positive rights plus positive negative rights, rights. Neg post negative rights, and then the reductio to that is enslavement to the point where you are equivalent to them. Okay, so yeah, exactly. I mean, if you don't set kind of, some kind of threshold on the the positive rights or some kind of way to limit the positive rights, then you basically get the, uh, let's call it like the positive right limiting 
LIMI limiting problem. And we'll just write in brackets there, uh, reduced to slavery. I, I, I might just, yeah, yeah, yeah. reduce is fine. Okay, yeah, so that, that'll be okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah. then, then we said, okay, well, we want to preserve positive rights. We want to preserve negative rights. So let's try again. In fact, you know what? Just yeah. for uh, order's sake, I'm going to. Uh, oh, we're, 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 we're getting really. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting really yeah. INTJ here, boys. I, I'm not an INTJ. You're not uh, an INTJ? No, I fit the INFJ um, oh type. Oh, gosh. Which, when you look at the like function stack, they, they have the same primary process, but there's a little difference there. Uh, I, so I would have taken you for an INTJ. Um, yeah, if you read the INFJ, it's like very similar, mm -hmm. but more um, more like uh, sort of emotional driven than uh, emotionally driven than logically driven. Although people don't think that of me, but you got to know me a little bit. Okay, negative rights plus positive rights with thresh plus threshold yeah positive rights with threshold yep let's do it like that um and so what where do we end up on that one we ended up that one infinite the reduct holocaust. Yeah. infinite infinite you're back to the infinite drown cost or infinite holocaust whatever you want to say because anything above that threshold um <clears throat> it's going to eventually run into a point where you're going to meet the convenience threshold that you don't want to step past and then you can just keep scaling up the suffering of the people that need help in a hypothetical that like you can help them, but overstep that threshold. So that leads to an infinite Holocaust, drown a cost, whatnot. Okay. So that's, that's pretty bad. So then we said, okay, fuck the thresholds we want to do. We're going to keep uh, negative rights plus positive rights. Mm -hmm. And we're going to say formulate, or let's do positive rights uh, limited by uh x that's uh de decrease oops de decrease wow decrease oh my god i'm fucking retarded today decrease or whatever i just said decrease. <clears throat> um in their suffering uh then let's go minus y which is the increase like, did I spell that right? Jesus Christ. Increase in my suffering. Um, yeah, so that, that'll be fine. Yeah. And so, yeah, so positive rights. So, uh, and then let's go. Yeah, uh, and there were, let's add in to, where, uh, well, one sec. Let's, let's yeah. add in where 0 to 1, 0 to 100 equals, um, uh, 0 to 100 equals obligation, and over 100 equals, oh my god, I wrote that wrong, obligation. This one's virtue. Yeah, virtue, uh, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> and where over 100 equals obligation. All right, so that, yeah. that seems correct there. And then the reductio. Reductio um, is, yeah, set y to 0. You don't have to do anything, and then you're you're standing by when kids get punched in the face. Yeah, so let's, um, so one second. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're on the same page here. Yeah, so decrease in their suffering. Oh, yeah, so the reductio for that is set Y to zero. So my suffer no suffering at all. <laughs> yeah, set Y to zero, yep. Um, it, so how do, how do I write, how should I write that? Um, I should so you say, like say um, the reductio would be, to accept, child, accept to child getting punched <laughs> at no at no cost to your own when i can stop it at no cost yeah when you can stop it at no cost okay yeah so that's that's pretty bad um and i just wanted before we go on to five when i can stop it at no cost and then I guess you can scale up the amount of kids being punched and then take it as a group. But it seems like if you process individual situations like that, it <laughs> would add up. So yeah, I'm not comfortable with that. So then uh, we said, you know, fuck this. Let's do negative rights plus positive rights. But in this case, let's make it limited by uh, X, which is the deep, oh my God, the crease. 
um, x divided by y, which is the increase in my suf suffering. Okay. Um, yep. And then we're going to go, oh, wait, yeah, let's add to that. Where, um, yeah, and we'll keep, we'll keep the same numbers, I suppose. Oh, no, we're going to have to uh, calibrate it for a ratio, aren't we? Because you can't get zero as a ratio. So um, let's say 1 to 100 equals virtue. And then let's, oh, my God. And then um, over 100 is obligation. Um, yeah, so that seems like an all right framing. Do we want to include the, the negative? I don't think that's even necessary, so that should be yeah. fine. Um, I think that yeah, works okay. pretty well, and I think it, I think um, it, yeah. I think I think these these equal signs are getting confusing though. So I think I'm gonna start um, going, just putting a dot at the end and going uh, productio, because the the equal signs are getting yeah yeah that's fine. Feel great. Um, Um, okay, yeah, this is looking better, um, except for all the uh, unknown words. Okay. Um, let's just see here. Okay, and then finally, five negative rights plus positive rights limited by X, the decrease in their suffering, divided by Y, the increase in my suffering, where 1 to 100 is a virtue and over 100 is an obligation. And did we get to the reductio on that was the uh, question. Ooh, um, that seems like a generally good position. It just seems like yeah. there's one or two little weirdnesses about it. Yeah, I, I can try. Um, so one of the things is that if you can take Y and X and bring them both really, really low, and you can set Y as a limit that approaches zero. So basically you are in a situation where you basically have nothing to do again. You, you don't have to do anything to help other people, but the help that the X value would also be very tiny. So it would be something like there is a slight negative thought that someone has for a microsecond. There's a slight annoying thought, ever so slightly annoying, that someone experiences for a microsecond. And then you can, t you can basically say your suffering of preventing that thought in the hypothetical, if you could prevent it from someone else, would be approaching zero, it would be a limit as y approaches zero so mm -hmm. i can always and change y. Make, yeah, yeah if you if you scale down y to approach infinity then the result of x by y is going to approach infinity uh if x is not also being scaled in some infinite way like that yeah yeah okay yeah so it basically seems like even in these tiny little minutia cases that is long because here's the thing at the end of the day compared to zero everything looks meaningful everything is gonna if i approach i could just keep reducing it closer and closer to zero and i'm always going to get over 100. so even if it's just the tiniest little nuisance then you would have to say that it's a moral obligation in these circumstances to alleviate the tiniest little nuisance, not even a virtu virtuous thing, it's a moral obligation, so long as it costs you actually nothing, or a yeah. limit as it approaches I mean, nothing. That doesn't seem that bad to me, though. If it costs, if the cost to you is just so fucking minuscule, and, and I mean, I don't mind calling it an obligation, is that really that bad? Um, it does seem kind of weird. I mean, like, technically, like, like mathematically, it, Within that framework, it's what follows. Let's say, it, um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it is what follows. It's just, 
to say that why can't someone just say like you know what i know it costs me nothing but like honestly what look how little it costs that person it's just a microsecond of this slightly annoying thing why should i care i know it costs me nothing but like why do i care about this mm. so let's just spell out clearly once for everyone what this situation here number five gets you around because this gets you around all of the uncomfortable reductios from the above examples. Um, I've talked a lot, so I will let mm. you do it. And then I think five, at that point, we're virtually, we're getting very close to me just biting the bullet on your position. Uh, like yeah. I mean, that's looking pretty similar to your position because your position is a ratio position. So yeah, why don't you tell everyone what is gotten around from the previous uh, attempts with- uh, All right, take, where are we, take, we taking it from the top? Am I taking it from the top? Well, yeah, oh, well, or more, more like explaining how number five would address all of the reductios from above. Okay, so number five, basically, it's the ratio of a de decrease in their suffering divided by the increase in the suffering of the person helping them. So look at all the things it gets around. So if you take X and you scale it up, so if the decrease in their suffering is scaled up, so if that would be a scenario where it's an infinite Holocaust, for example, there's like an infinite amount of torture going on, then you're obviously going to get your ratio above 100. So that makes sense because you get to say it's a moral obligation to stop an infinite Holocaust. Okay, so that's one thing it gets around. If Y approaches zero, then so it's... So that actually also gets you around the first three right there, I think, or no, not the slavery. It gets you around yep. the infinite drown of cost and the infinite yep. holocaust after the threshold though. So that's yep. one and three. Um, yep. And then also if you, if you increase Y, if Y is increased and X is large, but Y is increased not to as large as X is, but still significantly large, it could fall between one and a hundred where it's a virtue and not an obligation. So that now, gets also, around two. I, I think there's an empirical thing here that will trip people out, which is trying to think of what the number would be for a whole ton of people and then your number and how that could possibly land under 100. Remember, the actual numbers on the screen are arbitrary. So just a yeah. reminder there. It's more about the principled uh, system. Yeah. But yeah, continue. So, yes. so yeah, you've gotten around the, the uh, both the infinite holocaust in number one and the uh, infinite holocaust after the threshold in number three because you have positive rights on the table from number one. And there's not a, a limit on on the uh, positive rights. It's just it's it's looking at a relation between uh, the suffering produced for you and the well-being produced for others. So if you ever have to scale their suffering up really high, you're not committed to saying, oh, it's fine to just you know allow the infinite Holocaust to happen. I'm past my threshold. Then you also got around uh, two, which is this like positive rights limiting problem reduced to slavery. Yeah. So that gets us. So we got around one, two, and three. Now the question is, do and, we get around to, four? And just to, to mathematically spell out why you get around two, it's because if you scale up, you have like a decently high number on X, but then you also scale up Y to a point that you're talking about. And again, you could set this arbitrarily, but you know, scale up Y to a point that you're uh, living a really shit quality of life and not having uh, any fun and just dedicating everything to helping people, uh, that could land in the one to a hundred range which yep. is the virtuous but not obligatory range. So that gets you out of the slavery reductio and it gets you out of the infinite Holocaust reductios. Uh, but then we still ran into a problem, which was addressed mm. in four. So I'll let you hit that. Yeah. So in four, the problem was, what if I set Y to zero? Then we had to go and say, what if I reduce the threshold to get around the problem of reducing Y to zero so I don't look like I'm gonna stand by while a kid gets punched in the face. Then and the just problem for, for everyone who's not thinking as mathematically and quickly as you are right there. So if you set Y to zero, you're saying the amount of suffering caused for me by helping these people is nothing. Yeah. Yep. So the amount of suffering caused is nothing. Then I can, then it looks like you would say, okay, there's nothing I would do. I'm not, I literally have nothing to do. I could save this child from being bullet punched in the face, but since it's within my virtue threshold, but not my obligation threshold, I'm not obligated to do it. Yeah, so same. then we yeah. try, then the try was then to reduce the threshold 
to that point. But then the obvious problem is that you're back into slavery. So because if you just apply it to the real world, there are people who are experiencing far more problems than being punched in the face. They can use your money to experience a lot more of a decrease in well-being than the decrease in well-being of the bully being mm -hmm. punching the kid in the face. And then so... I have to reformulate this actually. So I think that R5 is actually more like six. And I think that R5 yeah. is something like negative rights plus positive rights um, limited, but I should have just, I'm not even gonna do it now. Limited by X uh, decrease. I am worried every time I spell that now, <laughs> they're suffering minus y uh, which is the increase in my suffering um where uh one to uh we tried to lower that threshold so let's say one to five equals uh virtue and plus five uh equals obligation um yeah and so the reductio for that was basically, as you were saying, slavery up to the point that the gap between you and these people is is five. Yeah. But you can, I mean, well, spell out how what exactly that looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, it's just you being a slave, um, up at, but you're a slightly better slave. It's the it's the inverse of what it the amount of suffering you would experience with a punch. It's the being a slave with the well-being of that inverse. So it's basically a slave, but a little bit better than a slave is what you're reduced to there. <clears throat> so let's say um, the, let's call that the reduction almost to slavery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that's, that's not too helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So, because you're going to have an obligation to help with everything that's in this over five range. And if, if things like people getting punched are in the over five range, then, I mean, you've got this, you got African children. Do I even need to explain? Like, I mean, obviously you're going to be reduced to spending like virtually every dollar you spend again on ice cream or something like this, you spend it on the against malaria foundation. It's going to help a ton of those kids. So right. it's coming at a pretty small cost to you. If you set your threshold that low, you're going to be spending virtually all your money, all your time, uh, helping towards some kind of well-being maximization effort. So, I mean, at that point, we decided to switch from a, uh, and a subtraction to a ratio kind of model here. So we're going negative rights plus positive rights limited by X, the decrease in their suffering, divided by Y, the increase in my suffering, where one to 100 is a virtue and over 100 is an obligation. And so this uh, gets you around this uncomfortable um, scaling down the, um, the uh, labor on your part to help out. Because if you get into some, you know, for, for, uh, decimal point approaching like, like, neg like uh, infinitesimal or whatever they call it in mathematics, if you start getting extremely small, like negative, infinitely reducing that number, um, then you're, you're going to actually get when you divide x by it you're going to get a number that is approaching infinity so for all these you know small situations where it comes at virtually no effort to you uh you're not committed to saying oh i have i have no obligation to not snap my fingers help the kid not get punched in the face you can say well yeah i mean the cost to me is so small that when you divide by the cost to me uh you actually get a positive number and it's going to justify that a very a hugely positive number yeah Exactly. So there's no justify not punching or, or snapping your fingers yeah. as an obligation, not a virtue. Right. So the, 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 the basic issue with, the, with six is that six gets around everything is because you don't have to change your threshold in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's that's the fundamental point, because if you ask the same, remember why the threshold needed to be changed, the threshold yeah. needed to be changed in the first place, because the question is, what if we set Y to zero? But if we set Y to zero, in six, if we just ask the same question for six, what if we set y to a, a limit approaching zero for the sake of making it mathematically intelligible? The answer is, well, it's an obligation because then the threshold is already over 100 or whatever arbitrary amount you set.
So six gets us around uh, virtually all of these. So you have the positive yes. rights obligation to get around these, you know, infinite Holocaust kind of examples in one and three. Um, you have the the uh, ratio in place and this this threshold of virtue and obligation, which gets you around the uh, slavery reductio. And then you also you have it set up as a ratio instead of a uh, absolute number. And that gets you around this um, reduction to almost slavery that you get when you say, you know, the decrease in my suffering is nothing and the increase in their well-being is a lot. Or you, you didn't frame it in terms yeah. of well-being, but you know what I mean? So yep. let's say now this is pretty much your position. So at this point, I'll put a criticism to you and you tell me what you would do with it. Yep. Okay, Go for so it. Let's say that we have... Um, two things that are both in the over a hundred area. So they are both uh, moral obligations. The uh, decrease in their suffering is sufficiently high and the uh, increase in your suffering is sufficiently low that you get a number well over a hundred. Now these two uh, moral obligations, the separation between them uh, in terms of, you know, I guess these are what units of moral necessity or something, I have no idea, but the, their, their gap is infinitesimally, infinitesimally small. Mm. Uh, you know, let's say it's an obligation to save two beings, and uh, one of those beings is just slightly, slightly more sentient than another. Uh, mm. Now, you'd say you have to save the more sentient being, correct? Yeah, correct. Uh, okay. okay, so what if the ever so slightly more sentient being who you have <clears throat> just this microscopically stronger moral obligation to is your mom? Well, I don't want to be calling my own mom. I don't want to get her on the line. <laughs> for, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, when Avi reduces people to really absurd positions, like like eating their family or something in Discord, uh, he likes to ask them to call their mom and confess their position to their mother. Yeah, I'm not going to call my mom and tell her that um, that if there was another stranger's mother and she was slightly more sentient... <laughs> <laughs> and my mom, I'm gonna let her die and save the stranger mom. Let me see if I can get my mom on the line. Of all of this. <laughs> I, I did on. like when we got Nick's uh, clinical psychologist mom in. Oh, I missed that. I can't believe I missed that. It was, oh. it was really funny. She basically told this guy that if he actually holds seriously holds the moral position he's claiming to hold, he's probably a sociopath. <laughs> it's just funny to hear it coming from a psychologist. But uh, okay. yeah. so, yeah. so what's, what's your response? Okay. What would you say to that? Because it seems like by this ratio system, you're committed to that. Yeah. Um, so basically what I would say is that there are certain base level deontolo either deontological or virtue ethics by the virtue of loyalty that I would just prefer to call it base level deontological value that I would place on the people that I am closest to. So I just value the people who I am, who I am in, who are in my immediate family and my closest friends. And I just value that above strangers to a certain degree. So I would choose my mother. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm just asking if it's still universal. Yeah, so I would say, I would say it's not just my mom. I would say I care about everyone valuing their own mom more than a stranger's mom to them. And it's not like there's some intrinsically th intrinsic thing in, in my mom that makes her more valuable than someone else's mom. It's just the relational system between me and my mom that makes me more obligated to care for my mom. And the, easiest, the easy way to start with this is for kids. When you have a kid and you have a choice between saving your kid or saving a stranger's kid, Okay, most then, yeah, most people would save their kid, right? So you can make an easy case because you're obligated for your kid. You have an obligation when you bring a child into the world, you have an obligation to take care of them. Well, and just, just okay. to address the universality point, I mean, it's kind of, it depends a little on what you mean by universal, but mm -hmm. it's, it's not universal in the sense that not everyone has a set moral value from every perspective. 
this moral system, but it is universal in the sense that the rule that's leading to the, the different values from different perspectives is applied universally. So whether it's a universal yeah. system would kind of depend on your definition there. Right. It's uni right. The universality is in the sense that if you, so for example, if, if it was between your mom and my mom and you were the decider, I, in my system right now, in my head, in my system, if there was, if it was between your mom and my mom and my mom was slightly more sentient than your mom <laughs> and you picked my mom, I would actually think you would be bad for that. I would think you would be doing a moral wrong. I think the right thing for you to do would be to save your own mom. And so, so yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so it's universal in that sense. So even even from my system, from my moral system, I, I'm not just saying I'm intrinsically valuing my mom. What I'm saying is I'm intrinsically valuing the value relation of other people to the people that they're closest with. So it's not like it, my mom is some like magically has more moral value. It's just that there is a valuation on the relation between between relatives. So if it's, if it's between my mom or your mom, your mom's slightly more sentient, I'm saving my mom. I would view that as the right thing to do. And if, it's, if you're the decider and it's between my mom and your mom, my mom is slightly more sentient than your mom. I would view the right thing to do for you it, by virtue of you being related to your mom would be to save your mom. Because of this, that there is some base level principle, there's a base level deontologic valuation of your mom in a way that you don't value my mom. And that's okay. And that's something that everyone should have at so, a base level. I think that what we'll need to do then is get the full Avi ratio. On oh, screen. yes. So we're going to have to write Ooh. this a little, a little differently. So we're going to – do you put your K before your X or after? Oh, oh, let's do an X, XK1 over YK2. Okay, so I'm just just because it might look confusing, I'll just put a multiplication sign in there for people. Um, times K1, and then we'll write what that is uh, in a sec, and then we'll do divided by Y um, times K2, and we'll write what that is in a sec. Okay, and then so K1, that's the base deontological value on you and beings related to you? Yeah, so K1 is K1 is the, my base deontological value of beings related to me. Sure, you can, you can frame it that way. Yep. Um, and that's multiplied. It's a multiplier, so it's a constant. Maybe I should just say me, me, and of, because it yeah. applies to you also. Yep, of me and beings related, close, most closely related to me. So like my family members, my children, siblings, parents. Um, in fact, we could just, you know what we could do? I think we could just do base deontological value of, of more related beings and base deontological value, um, deontological. Ooh, value ooh, I see. Of, I don't know. Ooh, ooh. More related beings gets tricky. Is that? We'll, all right, we'll go there. Does that yeah, formulate it weirdly, or do you? Are you trying? No, to no, set no, it no. Like, it's not. Okay. It's not. It's not formulated weirdly, but it le it can lead to some uncomfortable well, things. Because, because, okay, because there is a slight difference there, but I yeah. guess because the way you had it formulated was a closed system of you and who you're related to, not a sliding scale of how related yeah. you are. Yes, yes. So this which, this which can lead. Ooh, ooh. I see ahead of the chess the chess game. Okay, this can lead. <laughs> I see down the chessboard, 14 moves. This leads. This can lead to some pretty uncomfortable conclusions. Okay. Okay, so should we, we can not go, go, yeah. go? No, we, we can go there. We can explain it out. Um, yeah, and then we'll see if there's a reductio on it. Yeah, yeah. So what's, what's uncomfortable about that then? <laughs> okay. So let's say there's two people who need to be saved. There's a black person and a white person, Isaac. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is bad, actually. <laughs> yeah, I don't, um, I don't like that. I think that that's not a good place to go. So, yeah, I think that for for 
that, what should we write as the reductio? Okay, Re reductio, um, racism? I, don't, I mean, Re reductio is basic. Yeah, it, it is. Let's just call it racism. Let's call it racism. I mean, that's just what it is. <laughs> pretty, just, pretty simple. Um, okay. I'm glad that you caught that slight formulation difference. Okay. But I was not even thinking of that. Okay. Um, let's try right, it again. So, oh, yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Let, um, the based the ontological value of. Yep. Um, what, how do you want to phrase it? How did we have it before? Well, I said of your mo most closest related, uh, okay. most closest related beings or, or relatives. You can you can frame it either one. Yeah, let's just say a family. Or yeah, no, because I guess well, you'd apply it to your close. I would I would apply, apply it to my close friends and whatnot. Yeah, um, um, closest it's related. Like, it's, it's almost like you're building it on the the strength of the relationship or something. Yeah, strength of the relationship. Um, strength of the relationship. Okay, if I don't, yeah, but if I don't have a relationship with my kid, I would make a separate argument that I'm still obligated by, by virtue of like I made it, I I caused the I kid. Would, to, Oh, well, if you cause them to be alive, that's that's yeah. adding a special case, though. So yeah, that's, yeah, a yeah. Bit, that's a little bit different. If it was like your uncle and you're more related to them or right. something, like I mean, that it seems to me like if you had a best friend and some uncle you don't know, I'd probably fucking save the best friend. Yeah. Um. So we'll go deontological value of closest related beings. I think that's yeah. a fine way to put it. Yeah. Of, uh, I just want to say other beings. Uh, basically, of, of or, oh yeah um, of. Of, yeah, of unrelated, um, unrelated beings, or far further related, far related beings, sure. strangers. Um, yeah, I guess we want it to be as as opposite to that other one. So, yeah. um, closest related, no, related of, of non of closest. non closest related beings. I, I don't like the word related because it makes it sound genetic. You're, we're talking about a relationship. Closest, because mm -hmm. um, because relate because when you say related, it just sounds right, like right. the the thing from above. Um, what should we call that then? Um, um, of of clo close relationships? Uh, uh, of closest, um, of the closest camaraderie. <laughs> okay. Camaraderie? I don't know how to fuck to spell that. How did, I'm sorry, that's just hard. That's a, um, it's a camaraderie. Um, yeah, that's com comrade, right? Camaraderie? Oh, maybe it just doesn't realize it's a word. If I'm spelling it retardedly, then I'm I'm sorry, everybody. It, it's C O M R A D E R Y. C O M. Um, say it again. C O M R A D E R Y. Yeah. Um, okay, I did write that. The spirit that. of friendship and community in a group. I don't know if that leads to weird places. Also, um, I just want to say, like, relation. What, what is the yeah. fundamental thing you're saying then? The fundamental thing I'm saying is the closest, uh, the closest. Re the, the people whom one shares the closest relationships with. Um, of not, I don't know. Then what do we say for the negative furthest relationships? No. So I we mean, just say the, the people who uh, share not, not the close, who, who do not share the closest relationships. Um, let's just say because because the reason not, the reason I'm formulating it this way is because if I, I'm trying to avoid yeah. making it into a spectrum and trying to draw a line. Yes, exactly. I I, I see what you're trying to do. So yeah. I'm I'm just gonna accept that that it does not look nice in terms of English, but people know what we mean because we've been talking about it for. Well, actually, I'm sure there's tons of people watching. I have no clue what the fuck we're talking about. I I see you. Hi. Um, but I mean, I think that that gets across the phrasing. So then, is there any reductio for that that you have found? Who? Um, or is that currently where you're well, at? Well, well. What I wanted. Okay. I don't know if I can get there. If, if it's some super autistic limit problem, that's not even. No, it's not, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. Um. What I wanted to do, and I might be able to do this while getting around racism. I might not. What I wanted to do, the final step here, what I wanted to do is, because you know there's always this challenge to veganism that when someone says, oh, well, if you could save a, a cow or a, a human, if you had to kill one of the two and they were both equally sentient and the sentience would always stay the same, uh, which one would you kill? And 
it always seems like the vegan was in a position where they would have to say that I would flip a coin. And if there was slightly more sentient, the cow was just like slightly more sentient, I would kill the kid. Oh, now, that's yeah I, yeah. I actually think that that basically makes sense unless you have some special obligation or, or killing the kid is like in reality, killing the kid is likely to generate more suffering because of the beings that know the kid. But in a vacuum, I actually yeah, don't really see. Yeah, I don't actually really see something that egregious about saying save yeah. the more sentient animal. Like I'd say, save a more sentient alien. It's just something intuitively boggles us about a pig because pigs aren't more sentient. Yeah. So it's hard. What but when, if, you, when you have if something? Were, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say when you have a being you can actually picture it with, it seems mm -hmm. not that crazy all of a sudden. I think yeah. it just intuitively hits you weird because it's a pig. Yeah. Now, if this were a spectrum. What, what I would say is, what that would lead to is I would actually, on a base level, save the human, even if the pig was slightly high, more higher sentient, unless it could be outscaled. And if it would be outscaled, then eventually I would, I would uh, switch over. Well, and that's unless, the important thing. Unless I was not a human, unless you equalize that too, unless I was like a robot or something, then I, it wouldn't matter. And I, I, I would say like if I was a pig, it would, it would, I would choose the pig. Even if I, don't, was I don't know if I'd follow you there. I don't think there's anything egregiously morally offensive about it because it's mm -hmm. you always have this uh, whole like the relationship deontology can be outscaled by consequentialism once anything serious is happening. So that it's not like egregiously bad, but I just don't resonate with that. I feel when I don't feel any personal obligation to the being via some kind of relationship, I mm -hmm. basically just go to like assuming everything else is held constant, you want the more sentient being to survive, even if it's right. just by a little bit. Right. Yeah. I'm just trying to like, I know a lot of people who it trips out. And the reason it trips them out is because everything else is not wanted away and equalized. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I it, think that is yeah. why. Yeah. That's well, pretty, like, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm not seeing any big uh, problem at this point. Like I would basically be on board with that. I would, I would have a hard time going somewhere else. I can't see arguing a strong mm. negative or positive rights case against that and not coming out with one of the uncomfortable reductios. Yeah. Yeah. You would run into the racism reductio is the problem. So, well, on the, on the seventh version, we hit that. Yeah. You, you would run into seven. Yeah. So I think that we've pretty much achieved our goal there. So this is, Again, just hashing out our kind of position on positive rights. I tried my best to do some devil's advocacy there and not uh, not laugh at all while making some of those arguments, which I totally failed at. Some of the, some things are really hard not yeah, to laugh. At, it's I really would. hard to defend some terrible <laughs> positions. Well, yeah, <laughs> do it seriously. I mean, yeah, there, there's a lot of really hard consequentialists in veganism too who oh, have man. very weird views on this kind of stuff. Oh, I'm sure they're going to look at everything we're saying and say, just, just accept slavery. <laughs> <laughs> well, and just, or some dishonest, pragmatic argument against it. Like, oh, I'm doing, I'm, I bought an Xbox to save Africa or something. Like, just, <laughs> just nonsense. Just the cringiest yeah. thing. Like, well, you know, I really, I really do believe this. Like when I, when I got my PlayStation, like I'm, I'm thinking every video game, every video game, every extra <laughs> video game I buy, it's that one more African kid that I'm saving. <laughs> I, I, I was I was trying to sound serious, but I I like couldn't sound serious while saying that. No, I got you at the at, at, with the post sex meme. That's what that's what broke it all. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty funny. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, I think we've achieved basically what we want to achieve here. So this is just uh, some positive rights, negative rights kind of stuff. Like, I mean, again, it bears virtually no relation to veganism. Veganism follows from negative rights, and anyone who rejects negative rights is a lunatic. So I think, um, <laughs> yeah, but there's there's yeah. where I'm currently at and where Avi's currently at with positive rights. So if you, uh, if you have some challenge that you actually think is good, come into the Discord and see if yep. you can move either of us on this that's uh it's totally fine um, do you want to answer any like uh, any questions in the in the chat or whatnot i don't know if there are yeah, we'll, we'll see if they're being degenerate or not I, um let's see how do i even get to that um can i go to the the studio um yeah okay so here we go okay um yeah, do you have any questions? Superhuman dance, am I still banned? Yeah, I'm gonna ban you from here too. Move. 
Um, okay. Uh, is there any questions that anyone has, or are you guys just chilling in there? Avi, have you eaten the Impossible Burger yet? Yes, I have, and it tastes meatier than meat. This was scary. <laughs> no, honestly. Okay, so here's the thing. So the Impossible Burger, um, so it's made with leg hemoglobin. So basically what this is, is it's an actual plant-based heme. So it's, there are two species of plants. I think it's like alfalfa and soy. And they have the, in, in their roots, they have this symbiotic relationship with bacteria that because of there's some oxygen transport mechanism that they kind of symbiotically evolved. And they took the gene from that and they put it in, um, they put it in yeast. And then they just ferment the yeast and this yeast just pumps out leg hemoglobin. It pumps out, it's the impossible burger. They, it pumps out plant-based heme iron. And they take, they extract this plant-based heme iron and they put it in the burger. And it gives it, first, it looks like it's bleeding. It looks like it, it, actually it's bloody and it tastes, it has that meaty taste. When I first tasted it, it tasted like, it almost tasted meatier than meat. That's honestly the way I could describe it. It actually tasted more, it had more of that meat taste than, the, than an actual burger would. It was the you, scariest thing. Did you try the Beyond Burger? I have not tried the Beyond Burger. I need to do that. I, I have a place next to. I have a place next to my place. Yeah, but I I have a hard time. I'm you know I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna compare. But my um, standard is pretty high, Isaac. Here's the, the it's really high. This is li, this is li, and here's intuitively I just think prima facie that <laughs> the, <laughs> my tummy tells me literally that the Impossible Burger will win here because just by the nature of that, it, it has the actual substance of what makes meat taste meat. Of one of I haven't tried it. I, I bet it is better. People say it's better. I just you guys, you're in better. Canada, right? So you can't, I don't think you can get it in Canada. Can yeah, we got like Canadian Lee cooked. I'm going to oh. take one or two of these. Wait, so I can buy some. Can I buy some and ship them to you? If you do, I will be very happy. Um, I got a question here. Would I debate vegan gains? Yeah, we have three debates we need to do. We need to do the uh, pineapples on pizza debate. We need to do the AIU uh, retarded or dishonest debate. And then there's one other that we have to do. Um, Wait, what's pineapples and pizza? What is that debate about? He, he thinks that there's something fucking wrong with Hawaiian pizza. The guy's a lunatic. I mean, what the fuck are you on about? Like, well, like, what's the logic behind it? Like, what's it's just logically superior. I mean, you have to accept like, like deontological ethics to be on board with pineapple on pizza. That is, that's like the most superior, superior pizza. Is that the position? It's, it's, it's my position. Oh, okay. Um, natty or not, obviously I'm not taking steroids. Um, that's, uh, got any more questions? Uh, pronunciation of the word GIF. Yes. Thank you. How the hell do you know that? That is the third one. It's mm -hmm. weird that some people follow the little details of what we do online that carefully. That's really genuinely funny. Any more questions, guys? Um, we're getting uh, we're getting kind of I think wound down here at this point. Um, yeah, it's I think that's maybe about it. Um, yeah, and then I also I mean I need to. Oh, AI, are you still going to do the change my mind version with BG? Yeah, no, we're going to do that, but we're waiting for the students to come back. Uh, so probably like September or something. Uh, do you think Matt Dillahunty will ever become vegan? Doubt it. I think he's just dogmatic on that topic. Um, yeah. And then the thing I need to get back to is making this video fucking demolishing lay vegan. Have you seen the, oh, uh, the, the cringy, the cringe levels of just parroting philosophical vegan forum sophistry? I, I saw some of it and cause here's the thing I've read into I've read the whole wiki. I read his whole wiki. I, I, it took me, it took me days. Why? It took like, this and like I, I, I don't know. I, I, I read the whole thing. It took me, it took me a long time. And cause it was worded so badly. It was mm -hmm. worded in such an unclear way. And the concepts aren't even that complicated in that wiki. It's not complicated, mm -hmm. but it was worded in such an, it, 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 an unclear manner. It was worded in such this abstract way, in a way that it almost intentionally kept it in the esoteric realm as much as possible. 
It's like a grade 10 kid trying to write an essay. Yeah, it, it, well, more, way, way. It's, it's Rosetta Stone. It's, it's like this Rosetta Stone that you have to like- while, For a while, I remember we had you in Discord named as the autistic Rosetta Stone. Yeah, yeah. And no, I, I translated it eventually. I tra eventually I did translate it and, whew, wow. Um, he, he sent me some DMs. I basically, I've, I've been, res I responded to a couple of them and then eventually like, I was like, listen, just let's do this on voice. It's like, I'm, it's, it's taking too yeah, much sorry, time. Just, just to say, say the obvious, don't reveal the content of any. No, DMs. of course I don't, I don't reveal the content. Of I'm any sure, content. I'm sure, you know, I'm just, just saying it. Yeah. Um, all, all, all I would say is that, I mean, I, I, I had to, I had to stop because I, I can't devote that much time. <laughs> <laughs> I can't devote that much, um, yeah, but well, that's it, what but, I did eventually too. Yeah. So, so lay vegan. So, it seemed to me, it just seemed like it was just a parroting of the the philosophical wiki form. Um, yeah. Well, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it seemed basically like okay. That means the basic. Ooh, we're gonna go deep. We're gonna, okay. I don't. Know, without going too deep in the philo rabbit hole. Um. Did you get that philo rabbit hole? Um. That was funny. So I didn't get it. No. Over my head. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so like, okay, so these basic things like, okay, well, you didn't say that it requires a trade, Isaac. You didn't say that it was, ba that it needed to be based off of moral value, it needed to be based off a of trade. I mean, they, 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 they I mean, the, yeah, like some of the ones he used in that, in this video are, um, he says there's hidden premises, and then mm -hmm. later he says, um, the argument is deontological. And it's so funny why, like, Okay, so oh, his, like, his, it. yeah, his his argument that in fact the deontological one's funny. I could like start there, and <laughs> I know what you're talking about too because I read the philo I read the philo wiki, <laughs> and I know that argument also. I know exactly what you're talking about. I know, I, I, it, I know. It has to part two, right? Part two of name the trait leads to deontological veganism. Is that what the argument yeah. is? It, and he actually wrote an article for that sort of like carnist apologist type blog. Um, let them eat meat. And he talks oh. about, it's like, name the trade is the worst argument for veganism in history or something like this. And um, yeah, but anyway, he's, Lay Vegan says the reason he thinks it's uh, deontological is this sentence that there's nothing true of animals that if true of humans would uh, just buy anything short of non-exploitation. And it's like, yeah, you realize that everything true of animals is a set bucket of things and is not mm -hmm. the total amount of potential things. So you can't logically get to the fact that from saying there's a certain bucket of things within which nothing uh, justifies exploitation to the fact that uh, somehow there could be more things in the bucket. So the, the assumption it's deontological is just based on just like very poor English comprehension. And well, then, what is this a consistency checker? Is it, okay, it's, it's like, okay, well, would you do, would you exploit humans in this context with this more stuff in the bucket? And if the answer is yes, you would exploit animals. Exactly. Well, yeah, it's like, yeah. cause the total bucket of things true of animals, does that include a situation like a continent exploding is contingent on you killing this being? Well, yeah. no. Do you think that the rule to not exploit doesn't break down at that point? I mean, so it's, it seems, I don't know if it's just stupid or if they actually mm -hmm. didn't like comprehend. I think they, it's a combination, but anyway, uh, or then there are some other ones earlier in the video he's talking about. And my video on this is like an hour long. Like, I don't know if this guy's ever actually been like dished a heavy logical beating, but it'll be like probably by far oh, the worst yeah. he's ever received. <laughs> so at the start, he's trying to say, um, there's hidden premises, and the hidden premises are moral objectivism, uh, the wrong. Of course, of, of course, of course, <laughs> of course. This is literally everything we've heard before from from Philo. This is I, the same, I know, and literally. He, he won't debate me. Would he debate you? You'd wreck him. I mean, he wants he to debate, debate people me. who he knows don't know the argument well enough to actually, like, because this is the thing, Avi, you know the argument well enough to apply it multi-contextually. You can uh, apply it to random objects. I've seen you get people with it in a debate about mouse data, like asking them yeah. why, why they have this differ, different uh, standard for what kind of data they'll accept. So like you would wreck him if it got, if you got into yeah. it with him on this debate. And so I don't, I think he probably won't debate you, but he wants to try to debate like uh, people in my discord who he thinks don't know the right. argument as well. Well, he, now that this yeah. video is going to go up, he's not going to do anything for sure. No, I, I mean, he'll, he'll cut in the shadows, lay vegan, maybe he'll debate and be less of a coward. But anyway, it's, it's funny because it's like, yeah, so moral objectivism, double standards are wrong and morality is based on a trade. Oh, it's like, man. how did you infer any of those things from the argument? Like, 
Okay, so moral objectivism. Does, does a statement like X does and doesn't have value being a contradiction somehow hinge on the ontological status of morality? I, I it's just a system no. of relations within the subjective system. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, exactly. exactly. It's, it's, a, it's a particular relation. But yeah, and I mean, if you're talking, what's the other one? Um, double standards are wrong. And he thinks, he's like, name the trait only detects double standards. It doesn't detect contradictions. It's like, you idiot. You, when you get a double standard from someone, like they say, um, you know, it's it's okay to uh, stab animals based on intelligence, but not humans, or it's fine to, to do something to one, but not the other. When you get a double standard, name the trait as the tool you apply to that to see if the double standard reduces to a contradiction or has a consistent principle underlying it. So if they name a trait and reject the second premise, it's like they've found a consistent principle that they can use to justify um, whatever the action is in that specific context. Um, but, uh, if they can't name a trait, if there's no trait and humans have values, you can switch every single trait in the human, which renders them identical to an animal while retaining value. So you can't then state that an animal is valueless. Uh, that would be a contradiction. So the way you, you test for a contradiction is you, when you get a double standard, you apply name the trait to it and you see, do they name a trait thereby showing some kind of, uh, underlying consistent principle that justifies the double standard? Or does the double standard reduce down to a contradiction? So someone saying, um, hmm. I don't know. Wait, wait, wait. I don't know. So, so, okay. So I, I don't think double. Okay. So if someone says, for example, I only care about humans, right? Mm -hmm. So someone says that, and then you say, okay, well, can you name a trait between humans and animals? They would mm -hmm. say the trait is human. The trait yeah. is that they're not human. Mm -hmm. Would you take that as a double standard? Or? No, I mean that's just consistent. They're, yeah, they're, that is they're, consistent. they're naming the trait human. Yeah. There's absurd consequences to right. consistent positions right. that pass name the trait. But yeah. that's not that's not a contradiction at that point. Right. So it's like when you get when you get something that superficially appears like a double standard, um, you know, you get um just just this is okay to do to one being but not the other. It's like the thing you you do is you test it with name the trait and you see does it reduce right. it? contradiction or is there a consistent principle yeah. so if they the principle exactly. it's, it's a human and they bite the bullet on oh, stuff like um for example is it okay to kill you know well-intentioned uh, infinitely sentient beings an infinite amount of them is, is killing them fine because they're not human they bite the bullet on that it's like that's a consistent position that passes name the trait you've rejected the se second premise uh you've also justified an infinite holocaust of infinite sentience so you know yeah. grab out there um but if they were to to do that that is consistent where it would reduce to a contradiction is if they said, okay, no, I wouldn't do it. And there's actually nothing true of an animal that if true of a human would justify right, the action. Right. Because if there is no trait true of the animal that if true of the human would justify the action, you can switch every single trait in the human yep. to be identical to the animal while the human retains value. Law so of identity. Yeah, so they, exactly. So you can't then state the animal is valueless because you'd be contradicting yourself. A human but, but, is reducible but, but Isaac, uh, oh, yeah. but, but Isaac <laughs> essential properties yeah, see, <laughs> that's. I mean, it, all I nuclear hear explosion because of the previous timeline. If you go to the previous, if you equate the previous timeline, then it's a fermion and, and it goes and it's overlies in the same place, and then it would have to be a nuclear explosion. Don't you know both that? Of those, both of those are hilarious. So, like the nuclear explosion sophistry, that's just taking um, conceptual objects and pretending they're physical objects and being like, you'd be cramming atoms into the same location and it would explode. It's like. Well, you're, that's just a, a horribly stupid straw man. I'm not talking about physical objects. And then, um, what was the other? You're one? talking about you're an essential property. Properties. You're talking about not having an essential property that is <laughs> well, essential. Yeah, it's like either you're talking about something that exists objectively or not. If it's something that exists objectively, just just demonstrate it. And if it's just essential properties are this subjective thing, then that's going to reduce to some kind of crazy but consistent position if you bite the bullet on it. Like anything you just assign this essential property that there's no objective basis for to has value. And if you don't, it doesn't. I mean, that would be a kind of crazy zone. To it go would to. say something like, okay, so there's humans. And if you equalize the trait of ever being human, then you can't equalize the trait of ever being human to a human because the human would not be a human and never would be a human. So it's an internal contradiction and this whole thing, the whole thing explodes. Sorry, say that again. What's, yeah, what's so that? it's like, so, so, so basically you would say like, if, it's, if, there's a, if there's a human and you equalize all the traits, so the human now 
is no longer a human and never was a human in the past. No, that's just incorporating time, though, where because we're yeah. changing them in conceptual space where there's not time. Yeah. That's, that's trying to confuse conceptual space with right. like, space time. The hypothetical is a timeless dimension. Exactly. Hypothetical uh, is a timeless dimension. And then, and then the final one. So we did, yeah. So the the it only detects double standards, not contradictions. It's like no, you you apply it to double standards to test if they reduce to contradictions or right. have consistent principles underlying them. Uh, and then what was the other? It assumes moral objectivism. How how what in that argument assumes that morality is subjective? I mean, or objective? Yeah, you can. Still, I don't know how he got there. Yeah. You know, and he just says it's obvious in the video. So I I don't know that. And then uh, the other one is oh that morality is trait based now. Obviously, we we do hold the position that morality relates to the physical qualities mm -hmm. of objects. I mean, no shit. But that's not assumed in the argument on any level at all. Demonstrating that you're making a contradictory statement uh, about morality, you don't have mm -hmm. to establish what morality is based on. Just like to demonstrate you're contradicting yourself by saying your favorite, uh, you know, taste is and isn't chocolate is a contradiction without discussing yeah. what your taste preference is based on, or your favorite car is and isn't you know, a, a Ferrari or something without uh, right. talking about what your car preference is based on. It's like a contradiction is just a contradiction. And there's there's nothing about um, about the argument that it requires you to assume morality is based yeah. on traits. All you're looking at is, is this being reducible to this being well retaining value? You don't have to look at why yeah. you're giving it value. It's just either yes or no. And if the answer is yes, you can't then say it's valueless. The, the point to make here is that when we say trait, trait means it, it could be any contextual factor, internal yes. or external to that being. Mm -hmm. So it could be essential properties. It could be accidental properties. It can be intrinsic or extrinsic properties. Well, yeah, and, and subdividing traits into categories is just like an autistic yeah. way to confuse people. Like it's, it's very obvious we're just talking about anything that is in relation. This is for the sophists, well, Isaac. This is for the sophists. Because they're well, going to look at the episode. If the sophists want to do battle, uh, we await in the Discord, and we are happy to destroy you. You have um, some super chats for questions. Let's see. Oh, sh okay, good catch. I wouldn't have seen that. Okay, so super chats. Oh, dude, I don't see. Them. Um, let me. Scroll. Okay, I, oh, I can read them shit. if you want. Okay, wait a sec. I want to make sure I catch all of them. Um, okay, there's just a few here. Um, yeah, I'll let you answer them. Um, okay, but I'll read them, I guess. Is it possible to think about the unknown and or can you establish truths about the unknown through what is known? Why don't you give your, uh, your take on that? <laughs> um, okay, so this really depends. Um, so, okay, so if something is the unknown, by, the, by definition, it's the, it is the unknown. You can't know it. That being said, so deductively, I would say no. On the deductive level, if something is unknown, by definition, it is unknown. You can't say it's unknown, therefore I know some truth about the unknown, if it's categorically, categorically unknown. Now, that being said, there are certain formulas where you can use to apply certain inductive, not deductive, but inductive uh, approaches to the unknown. So, for example... In ecology, there was it's, there's an actual formula. This oh, this is way back. There's a formula for the rate of newly discovered species that you're discovering, and how that rate changes based on what you're doing. And you can plug those things into a computer, and the computer can actually calculate out for you the expected amount of newly undiscovered species that would happen later, and it it matches up pretty well. So you can kind of compute based on what you see. In the unknown, you can kind of expect what would, there are certain cases where you would expect what you would actually find, even though it technically deductively remains the unknown. I mean, look, if is the sun going to rise outside tomorrow is a deductive unknown to me. I inductively think it will. Um, okay, I would, I, I think that these kind of questions, it just depends on how you define the thing. Yeah. And by these type of questions, I don't know if I can right now think up how I'm categorizing that, but I know there's a type of question that's like this. Um, so when you're saying, you know, the unknown, it's like unknown and known are just opposite terms. It can, something can't simultaneously be known and unknown because like, I mean, te technically maybe you could be, make some retarded semantic argument that somehow those aren't opposites. If we replace <laughs> known if we r write it out logically like it is true that this is known and it is not true that this is known or something like it's just they're they're opposites okay so 
by definition, the things that you, you know, figure out, whether it's uh, like inductively, deductively to whatever level of certainty, those enter the territory of being known. So the second you reason about something that's currently not known and you gain that knowledge or potential knowledge, uh, that is it's known to the degree that you have that knowledge. So it's, yeah. it's never that something is simultaneously known and unknown. So it's a bit of an equivocation on unknown mm. if, if you're thinking of like the process of discovering scientific facts about things we don't know yet as like discovering the unknown. Like that's actually just switching a thing that's unknown to a thing that's known. It's like something switching between those two states. It's not actually anything ever having both of those states at once. So yeah, so I, I would say no, you can't simultaneously know and not know something. And when you discover things that were not known a minute ago, you've just changed their status. Yeah. I will I will answer this question like a sophist. Um, here's how a sophist, this? yeah, yeah. No, the same question, same oh, question. Oh, okay. <laughs> here's, here's how a sophist would answer the question. Is it possible to think about the unknown? Yes. I just thought about it. <laughs> and or, <laughs> <laughs> and or can you establish truths about the unknown through what is known? Yes, I can establish truths about the unknown through what is known. The truth about this unknown through what is known is that it is known that it is unknown and that is the truth that is unknown. Yeah, so, okay, that, that's really funny because a lot of people, when they get something like that, like you can come up with weird little, um, I don't know if it was quite self-referential, but weird little paradoxy sounding things like that in the animal context. And sometimes they trip people out. It's, it sucks because a lot of people don't have the philosophical tools to tease those apart. But again, like the trick with all these things is to just look at the definition of what's being talked about and just make sure it it's all from the definition level making sense. So what he just said he knew was actually his conceptual thinking about the unknown, not the unknown itself. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. you track that, you realize it's sophistry. But um, yeah. Okay, let's, uh, it's also funny, like, it's uh, just us casually telling each other we're committing sophistry. It seems funny when you don't picture the context of, like, yeah, okay. Okay, so then let's read the other one. I'll let you answer that, too. Um, there's other questions in here. I sound like Aladdin, favorite Britney Spears song, having a good evening. Yeah, of course, all those things. All right, Muggs has a question. This is the guy who originally asked the, the mom <laughs> slaughter sentience gap question or whatever. I, I believe it was him. Mm -hmm. uh, saying racism is a reductio is implying genetics are key in the relation. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. what we said. How is it not reciprocation and appreciation? Genetics have nothing to do with it, except if they didn't exist, you wouldn't. Okay, well, we, we kind of answered that, but you can yeah. you know say. say yeah, that. so we, we backtrack off that, right? We backtracked off seven and we went to eight. So the closest the relationships you have with people. Um, appreciation that goes into it, the relationship you have with people that goes into it. How is it not reciprocation? Okay, when you talk about reciprocation, I would not say it's categorical reciprocation because if my mom was put into a universe box or isolated or, or had a wizard like wand away. I still think I still think I would place some base level value on her that I wouldn't on other people. I don't know. I mean, I think I think I wouldn't like pour, I wouldn't push the torture button on if I had to push the torture button on my mom in a universe box versus pushing the torture button on a slightly more sentient being of someone else's mom outside of the universe box in waving away, wanting away all the negative pragmatics and all the negative external factors to that, I don't think the current state of reciprocation would change my view on it. I think it would be more appreciation based and it would be more loyalty based to the relationship that we have. I think that's what's, what it would be based on. I think that also, yeah, just the, the kind of key thing there is, he, I mean, Muggs is asking, you know, how, how, how does it lead to genetics? It has nothing to do with genetics. Well, we, we formulated it at one point genetically that like we actually, we did that by accident and then we're like, oh, well, let's, let's just stick to it and show where that goes. And it just goes to racism. basically. Yep. Very directly, <laughs> very clearly. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've, we've done what we want to do. Do you have any closing words, anything you want to say? Oh, XK1 over YK2. <laughs> the ratio. <laughs> the ratio. All right, I, guys. I that's... Moral systems, all that good stuff. You know it. All that get shit. Board, that get, get, on, get on board with all that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, if you guys want more, come to the Discord. You can find Avi in there pretty easily and sub to his channel. It's down below. Do it. All oh, right, that's right. I have a channel now. You do. You do. You've been forced. All right. Until yeah. next time. 
Later.